Welcome back to the channel. This is Trendy Storm, and you were watching first part of What if Naruto and Konoha 12 were betrayed by the Leaf? If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Now, wasting no time, let's start the story. Following the group's fruitless attempt to bring Sasuke back, sadness on Naruto's face, he peered out of his hospital window. He had attempted, but failed, to bring Sasuke back. Just to prove they could, Shikamaru, Neji, Lee, Choji, Kiba, and Shino faced the enemy, and he was defeated. Something knocked on the door. Silently, Sakura opened the door. Sakura said, Naruto? Can I come in? Naruto replied, Sure, Sakura. Sakura walked in and closed the door. She approached Naruto and gave him a quick pat on the head. Naruto said, Ow, what was that for? For giving me and the others a fright. Hanada was so scared she passed out. Sakura replied, Naruto gave a shy smile. I'm sorry. I tried to bring Sasuke back but his eyes were so full of hate Sakura. It's like he became a different person. I couldn't keep my promise to you. Naruto replied. Sakura took hold of his hand. I shouldn't have asked you that. I was hoping that Sasuke was merely misled and that his hatred has won. I'll get stronger, Naruto, and I'll help you drag his ass back here. We are a team and thighs why abandon theirs friends are trash. Sakura responded. With intent green eyes, Sakura caught Naruto's attention. He gave her hand a squeeze. Thanks, Sakura, it means the world to me. I know the council is angry but I tried my best, Naruto replied. They have already called a meeting. Shika was called in. Maybe the council won't be too bad. My mom however can be a bitch. Sakura replied. Naruto laughed. Naruto questioned, you don't blame me for not bringing your love back? Naruto, I don't like Sasuke that way. I don't like you in that way. You are more like an annoying brother, Sakura responded. Naruto smiled like a fox. The council was in a furore as the two struck up a conversation. Tsunade scanned the room with a glare. Some of the smaller Nin clans were in a furore, and so was the civilian council. Shikamaru was nearing the end of his report. Hormura got to his feet. I think it's time to rid our village of the dead last. Banish him. Hormura replied. Both the heads of lower shinobi clans and civilians concurred. Tusnade let out a roar. Enough. He did his job. He was beaten to almost to death to bring back the Uchiha. Tsunade exclaimed. Higher clan chiefs concurred. Some of our children went with him. They fought so that Naruto could get to Sasuke and still Naruto didn't bring him back due to outside help. You have Kakashi's report to tell you what happened. Shikaku responded. Hormaru said. Kakashi is biased. The boy is his student after all. He could have lied. Said Hormaru. There is a cry for banishment from both lower clan heads and civilians. Danzo got to his feet. Hokage, I agree. We should banish him. Of course we need the Demio to agree. Danzo replied. Tsunade gave him a scowl. The old fart was up to something. Tsunade said something. Tsunade declared, a vote then. Majority wins. I vote Naruto stays. I vote he stays. As a pack leader, you don't kick out one of your PAVK members when they fail and Naruto doesn't deserve that. Sume replied. Hiyashi declared, I vote he stays. Shinny stated, I vote that he stays. Inochi stated, I vote that he stays. Sho declared, I vote that he stays. Mom Asuna said, I vote he is banished. Sakura's mother. I will vote for the Uchiha. I vote he is banished. Danzo replied. Banished, 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 banished. Tsunade glanced up at the final pair. Banished. Dismissed. Tsunade felt as though a bullet had been shot to her heart. She had to report to the Demio. Abruptly, the doors opened, revealing a messenger from the Demio, and she got to her feet. Greetings, Konoha Council. I have learned of a betrayal and a botched attempt to rescue the final Uchiha. As Demio, this is giving an enemy access to a valuable resource, and those responsible will be expelled from Fire Country by sunrise the following day. The following names are on the list. Hayuga Neji. 
Kiba Inazuka. Nara Shikamaru. Akamichi Choji. Aburame Shino. Rock Lee. Uzumaki Naruto. This law is unchangeable. Signed. The messenger blew away, surprising the majority of the council with their ability to entice the Uchiha back. Hiyashi, Sho, Shikaku, Sume, and Shini were stunned, and Tsunade was crying. She brushed off the meeting with haste, glancing at the group that had lingered, their agony evident on their faces. Tell them that Hokage made an attempt. You made an effort. Someone misinformed Demio. Tonight, send the kids outside. The clan leaders hurried to tend to the children as Tsunade spoke, I'll make sure that no one finds out about Naruto's friend until they are safe. Tsunade cast a cold glance in one person's direction. Kakashi, you are now free from your responsibilities as a Konoha shinobi. Suande said, if you'd like, I'll. Kakashi's voice was icy. There was an uncomfortable silence at the hospital, so Kakashi knocked on Naruto's room and said, no, Hokage, I'll tell my student. Sakura was surprised to see Kakashi there and spoke. Naruto. I. Naruto and Sakura looked up at him, and Naruto started crying. Don't have the exact words by the Demio has ordered you and everyone else in the retrieval party to be banished from Konoha and Fire Country effective at sunrise tomorrow, Kakashi said, his voice breaking. It is as a result of Naruto's Kayubi. Yes, Kakashi Sensei, isn't it? Both men gave her a sidelong glance as Sakura spoke. How? Kakashi uttered. Come on, Sensei, Hanada informed me that October 9th is Naruto's birthday. I worked out the rest. They believe Naruto will go insane and murder everyone. As of now, I'm no longer a shinobi of Konoha, Sakura declared, removing her headband, leaving Kakashi stunned once more. Trash is those scum who leave their friends behind. To me, Naruto has acted more like a brother. Sakura said, I won't leave him behind. Kakashi grinned and took off his headband, telling Sakura to gather ceiling scrolls and pack everything they would need, adding that he would get the others and meet her at the other side of the gate. Sakura left to do this, and Naruto hurriedly changed into his clothes and went to check on the others, who were also getting ready to leave. Soon, Rock Lee, Neji, Choji, Shikamaru, Kiba, and Naruto were at the meeting spot, and Shino was getting close when Ono, Sakura, Tenten, Hanada, Konohamaru, and Hanabi appeared. Kiba remarked, guys, you weren't banished. Yes, we gave up. What right do we have to support a village that exiles the rescuers and harbors a traitor? Naruto glanced into the girl's eyes and said, Ino said. We must permanently depart from fire country. We might not come back. Naruto remarked, you guys won't see your family. We are aware. We decide to be friends. Our parents will comprehend, Ino remarked, causing Naruto to start crying. Kakashi poofed and the group's perspiration fell. Yo. We must leave. To remind everyone of the laws pertaining to the fox, Danzo had Tsunade call an urgent meeting. They were headed to the border when Asuma, Kurunai, and Guy collapsed. The sooner the better, Kakashi declared. Kakashi. Guy exclaimed, how unyouthful to leave without us, and Kakashi began to perspire. Kurunai said, we are coming too. We don't support the Demio decision. Suddenly, Anko appeared out of nowhere. I will also be attending. The group decided to go west because they didn't want to jeopardize the other countries. The fire Demio was the most powerful and the others bowed to him. To go to one could be war so they decided to go west. The group looked at each other before jumping over the wall into the unknown west. The village won't miss me, Anko said. The group hurried towards the border. The sun was almost rising as they made it to the unknown lands near the huge wall. Shizune entered the room with a sour expression on her face as Naruto and the others headed west, leaving Tsunade in a state of drunken stupor. She had let her friends and adopted grandson down, and she had attempted to shield them by going one step ahead of them. Lady, rumors have it that Naruto has taken all of Konoha 11 and their census with him. Tsunade grinned, the council will definitely find out, Shizune remarked. Then, he'll be safe. I have to locate Jiraiya. Inform him. In accordance with my directive, the Konoha Eleven and their sensei are no longer shinobi of Konoha. Asuna stormed in her face red, but Tsunade said, they're free to leave if they wish. Shizune nodded. 
The demon brat has abducted my daughter. To bring them back, send Anbu. Tsunade massaged Asuna's temples as she screamed. Sakura, Asuna, departed since she is aware that Naruto is a friend and teammate. Additionally, since you attempted to shoo the Uchiha at her. Tsunade rubbed Asuna's temples once more and said, she has made the decision that she has and there is no return. Asuna screamed until Shikaku knocked her out. Hokage, there's a message from Wave. Should I read it? An Anbu inquired. Gentle voiced, Tsunade said, yes, dragon. Any Konoha shinobi, caravan, or business that wishes to enter Wave will be required to pay a 20% toll fee in addition to a 10% entry fee, as decided by us, the citizens of Wave. The company will be required to pay a tariff of 30% per load on imports and 50% on exports if it wants to conduct business within the Wave Nation. Also, unless they pay $1,000 per person, no Konohayans are allowed to enter through the Great Naruto Bridge. Acknowledged. The Anbu read, the citizens of Wave. Tsunade grimaced. Wave Demio wasn't as strong as Fire Countries, so he couldn't refuse outright, but the citizens could make it a living hell. Tsunade couldn't wait to watch the money. Hungry bastards begin to sweat. Eventually, word spread, and the merchants came up with an idea. They would raid the abandoned Namikaze estate, knowing that Minato would understand if they took the money and items they denied Naruto. The group went to the estate, finding it unguarded. They entered and started looking for anything they could find. One man found a scroll that said, Inheritance. Quickly, the group gathered around the scroll as the nin opened it, revealing Tsunade's name along with a pile of banknotes, he 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 The nin handed the letter to an anbu to deliver to Tsunade, who read it somewhat soberly before opening her eyes wide. The merchants leapt up with joy as they snatched up the money, greed in their eyes. Tsunade, lady. We have decided to clean out the rotted roots, we will train the children elsewhere. Please don't look for us. Additionally, Konoha is about to have a huge problem if the greedy bastards took the money as their counterfeit notes. Please take care. I have removed all of Naruto's inheritance, the Uzumaki and Namikaze names and contributions from Konoha. Konoha is no longer the home of Naruto Uzumaki, any of the Konoha 11, myself, and the other John and Sensei. Kakashi had learned seals from Minato and Jiraiya so he had probably planned for this madness. Tsunade smiled as the sun began to set. Soon, the true repercussions of the council would be in full force. She laughed, realizing that Kakashi had beaten the greedy asswipes to the punch. But she also knew that once the sun set, anything that belonged to the estate and was part of Konoha would be useless. Beyond the western wall. When an arrow landed in front of them, the group stopped, and Kakashi looked up without showing his eye. Sakura was bouncing along beside Ino, making small talk, but Kakashi walked point with the genin and sensei spread out to allow for better range of motion. Why are Eastern Shinobi here, and who are you? A voice said. We were exiled from the nation we previously called home, which is why we are here. We just want to start over here, Kakashi replied. The voice went silent, and then a man, who appeared to be in his twenties, jumped out of the trees. He was talkative, thin, and had a long, black bow in his hand. His hair and eyes were both green. I take your words to heart, but this is not a place for kids. Naruto was going to speak until Sakura spoke, but the man trailed off, saying, there are those who would kill just for fun and as for the women. All right? Guts and blood? Sexual assault? We're going. The group soon arrived at a clearing with a few tents. Men were milling about, sharpening weapons and such. Kiba smelled an overpowering stench that burned his nostrils. Akumaru was whimpering too. Something wasn't right. Palas grinned as he led them into the center of the clearing. Palas turned around and yelled. Sakura said, we'll go down fighting first. Hi everyone. Fresh meat. The group assumed defense poses, hoping to fight their way out of this mess. The monster started attacking from all sides, and soon all were bloody. They had taken out a few, but more kept coming. Kakashi and Guy used hand. Two. Hand combat, and Kuranai used her tricks. Eventually, they were all exhausted. Naruto used shadow clones, but these things could see through them. Suddenly, a figure landed in the middle of the fray, with a long black cloak and a staff in their left and a long sword in their right. The figure crossed the sword and staff and spoke words that were legendary in the east, saying, found you. 
you will be punished for the crimes you have committed against the defenseless people who are calling for justice. You'll be set free for the innocent souls you once were. You will be defeated by the evil that resides within. The monsters started to burn with purple fire as the figure said, now, feel the flames of the purifying soul. They screamed as the fire got hotter and hotter until the monsters were dead and reduced to ash. Kakashi stood there, shocked that the western legend was real. Kakashi, is that possible? The figure looked at them with purple-violet eyes, and Kakashi bowed. Asuma asked. Kakashi nodded numbly. Word had spread to the east of a powerful sorcerer who wielded the power of the legendary soul star, a gem long since destroyed. Some believed the legend, but most doubted it. Kakashi now stood in awe of the power this one person held. I appreciate you saving us. Kakashi sank to his knees as he recognized the figure from a long time ago. She grinned. I only thought such power to be mythical but I have been proven wrong, Kakashi said. The figure pulled off the hood, revealing her moon pale skin and midnight blue and purple hair. Hi there, Kakashi. It appears that you are doing well. Naruto was the first to speak, leaving the group stunned as she said, and the village finally revealed its true colors. Who is this, Sensei? A companion? Naruto inquired, and Kakashi gave a numb nod. This is Riska, the Soul Queen. Konoha. Tsunade cast a chilly gaze on the council, blaming the majority of them for Naruto and the others' departure. Why is there an emergency meeting today? Danzo sneered. As of this morning's sunrise, the mistreatment of their friend Naruto has caused Rock Lee, Neji and Hanada Hayuga, Kurunai, Kakashi Hitaki, Gai, Anko, and Asuma to leave the Leaf Village, along with Naruto Uzumaki, Sakura Haruno, Kiba Inazuka, Shino Aburame, and the second generation Ino. Shika. Cho Trio. Tsunade remarked, they no longer have faith in the village and its residents. How dare I? The council cried out. Hokage, you need to go get them. Now that they are missing Nin that need. Retraining, Danzo remarked, drawing a glare from Tsunade. Not at all. I've already released them from service and allowed them to go in my capacity as Hokage. I'll send Root after them, Tsunade said, adding, if they left, they left. Danzo let out a disappointed grunt. As of right now, Danzo is no longer the Hokage's advisor. He will hand over all information related to the Hokage Tower, and the Hokage will have authority over his spy group. Effective immediately, Suande declared. Danzo became enraged, but the civilians were only upset because this was the Hokage. Who is going to take my place? Tsunade grinned as the doors opened to reveal Hiyashi, and Danzo exploded. Tsunade declared, Hiyashi will replace you. Danzo growled but remained silent, realizing that Tsunade had the upper hand for the time being. Shizune uttered, Hokage, letters from Suna and Spring. Read them. Greetings from Konoha, Hokage. Suna has learned that your council decided to exile Naruto and everyone involved in the abortive attempt to rescue missing Nin Sasuke Uchiha. We have chosen to permit you to carry on doing business in Suna as a result of your actions, but you will be required to pay an additional 30% in tariffs on imported goods and 50% on exported goods. We won't start a war, but we also won't offer assistance unless our demio gives the order. Regards. Gara, the Suna Cage. Shazun finished reading. Shazun opened Spring's letter and a man said, so, we barely do any business there. To everyone in Konoha. As of this letter, no civilian or Konoha Nin may enter Spring. Such traders will never be accepted among our people. Spring won't let any Konoha companies operate. Additionally, Spring will not transact business of buying or selling go with anybody connected to the Konoha village. You risk being executed or put in jail if you violate these conditions. This is the last one. The council erupted into chaos as Shizun read, Koaiki, Demio of Spring. The silence was eerie. They're not able to do that. We are more powerful than they are. Start a war. The others yelled, but Asuna responded since she stood to lose the most. It's enough. Tsunade cried out. The Spring Demio has made their voice known, and I have no doubt that they approve of this. This meeting will continue. As I previously stated, Naruto is no longer with us, and unless the Demio overrides the law, nothing changes. I would also like to know who you banished. 
The Origins of Naruto In addition to being my relative, Naruto is the son of Minato Namikaze and Kashina Uzumaki. You have banished Konoha's son, the greatest hero ever, Tsunade remarked, eliciting silence from the council. A chubby man said, you lie. You are also foolish. Blue eyes and blonde hair. Who else could be his father since he is not a member of my clan? A knock on the door revealed that they had banished Minato's son, and the disbelieving council had just realized they had done so, said Inochi. Tsunade said, enter. An Anbu carrying a message from the tea country came in. This is UHA from tea country, Hokage. Tsunade nodded, and the Anbu poofed away. He has brought a message from his leader, the Anbu stated. My leader has determined that these will be the new terms, Lady Hokage. Konoha will still receive tea from us, but we want all tariffs and taxes reduced to a mere 0.1% oh, of the profit. We'll let Konoha conduct business with tea as well. UHA stated, the taxes and tariffs will be 50% of the profit. Tsunade looked around, feeling sickened by the dollar signs in the civilian's eyes. Tsunade stated, we agree to the terms. UHA then brought in a document, which Tsunade signed and stamped, and UHA quietly left as an anbu burst through the door. Lady Hokage, the magnificent scroll with the Uzumaki and Namikaze scrolls attached. Tsunade stood up and said, we can't find it anywhere. The anbu agreed. Find it right away. We must keep it from the enemy. The council was in disarray once more, Tsunade cried. One Anbu fled while another ran in holding a smaller scroll, which she opened to reveal a clone of Kakashi. Hello, don't stress over the scrolls. Since his great, great-grandfather was the second Hokage and he made the scroll, I have them because they are a part of my Naruto heritage. Additionally, Kashinas and Minato. Sensei's contributions to Konoha have been entirely erased. Konoha betrayed both its own village and the village of Uzu. Neither we nor this scroll are worthy of you. The council was taken aback when clone Kakashi said, goodbye, exploding into white powder. Minato was in charge of the village's defensive mechanisms and the potent seals Konoha used to keep its secrets safe from prying eyes. Fear was visible on their faces. Asuna started, Lady Hokage, we have to. Tsunade grinned. Not a thing. The scrolls represented Naruto's ancestry. I will get that scroll back. Danzo yelled, as you said, he was banished by the Demio so he couldn't come back to collect them. Tsunade said in her last voice. We've concluded our meeting. As the group departed, Tsunade thought, I have to find a different defense for our village. Like they deserve it. Shizun approached. Tsunade opened it, and Shizun said, Lady, a letter from Jiraiya. Tsunade. You must go too. I will find Naruto and the others and stay with them. I missed the first 12 years of his life and I will not miss it anymore. What the hell? The DAMIYO banished Naruto. I will not reverse summon him. I will find him and try to stay with him. Jiryu. Tsunade grinned and said, Jiraiya would find Naruto and the others and make sure he was safe. Tsunade then started attempting to figure out how to maintain the defenses. Above the wall. Sakura and Ino checked on the injuries of Anki scrapes and bruises and soon everyone was sitting around the same fire. Riska led the group to a small cove that was tucked away from the main path. Once there, she showed them where they could wash the blood and dirt off. They did so quickly and soon were clean and dry. Now that everyone is here, I'd like to know your names. Riska responded. I'm Sakura, this knucklehead is Naruto, and the one hiding in the shadows is our teacher Kakashi said Sakura. I. I'm Hinata, this is Hanabi, and this is my cousin Neji. I'm Kiba, the pup is Akumaru, and this is Shino. I'm Ten Ten and this is Anko. I'm Guy and this is my student Rock Lee. The group introduced themselves as Asuma, Konohamaru, their nephew, and Kurunai, their girlfriend. Raisuka declared, my full name is Raisuka Namikaze. Though not exactly how, Kakashi knew that Riska was Minato's kin. Naruto had a curious expression. You have the same name as our Yandaimi. Namikaze. Naruto replied. With a tense expression on his face, Kakashi asked Riska, yes, he and I are kin. You are an Uzumaki? I guess. I'm an orphan so that's the name they found me with. 
I don't know who my parents were or why they abandoned me. Naruto sighed. Riska gave Kakashi a menacing glare. Kakashi said. Naruto, I think it's time you learn of you past. Of your parents now that the laws of the village do not apply to us. Kakashi spoke softly. Naruto gave Kakashi a look. You know who my parents are and the village laws wouldn't let you tell me? Why? Replied Naruto. Kakashi said. Because of the laws. I tried to help you multiple times but the greedy asswipes on the civil side wouldn't let me. They see you as a demon. And as for your parents. Your father is Minato Namikaze the Yandaimi and your mother was his wife Kashina Uzumaki. Kakashi continued. At first, the genin were silent, but Kiba burst out laughing. Oh boy. The dumbasses banished the only child of the two greatest heroes of Konoha. Boy, they are stupid. Kiba chuckled. Sakura turned to face a stunned Naruto. Naruto? Inquired Sakura. The hero I looked up to was my father. All this time, my father was one hell of a man. I can't believe it. Naruto spoke softly. Kakashi was waiting for additional feedback. They banished me because of Sasuke. From this day forward, I will be known as Naruto Namikaze. Uzumaki. My parents died so I could live. I will honor their legacy and keep the fires of hope alive. Naruto cried out. The group laughed at the shenanigans. Naruto glanced at the previously silent Riska. If you're kin to my father, you're kin to me. I don't know what to call you. Naruto replied. Riska is fine, Naruto. I'm not big on titles around friends. I'm glad that you finally hear. Replied Riska. Naruto peered out at the camp's smoke. I wanted to be Hokage to be respected. Now I want to bring peace to this world. This will be our home. I can't ask you guys to take those chances with me but. I hope you will. Said Naruto. The genin got to his feet. We are a pack, Naruto, we rise together and fall together. Kiba replied. Naruto observed the genin, who glared at him. Naruto grinned. The census moved to one side, but Naruto was aware of their response. Riska, will you help us? You have lived here the longest and we could use your advice. Naruto replied. I have waited a long time for those who will aid in getting peace to this land. I will aid you in your fight. Riska responded, with a calm expression, Naruto gazed at the moon until a toad appeared out of nowhere. And three people that Naruto believed he saw again were on its back. Tsunade slid down and said, hello, brat. Shizune trailed after her. Grinning, Jiraiya sat on his road. What are you guys doing here? What about the village? Aruka sensei and Ayame? Replied Naruto. With those people on his back, another toad poofed into view. Naruto leapt to give Aruka and Ayame hugs. Naruto trailed off, Ayame, where's? Ayame started to cry. Tsunade raised her voice. Danzo had his members kill him, Naruto. That why I left. Danzo somehow convinced the Demio that I'm too incompetent to be Hokage so as soon as Jiraiya arrived I left, bringing Ruka and Ayame with me. Tsunade replied. It was Jiraiya who spoke. A village that rewards hate is not a place for me. Besides, I haven't been to the west since I was younger than you. Jiraiya replied. The group was ecstatic to have arrived, but Jiraiya paled upon seeing Riska. Jiraiya asked, R. Riska? You found them? More or less. And yes Naruto knows we are kin. And Jiraiya, my threat of peeking still stands. Riska responded. Just as Jiraiya was scrambling back onto his frog, the group burst out laughing. They discussed strategies and training plans for the impending battle as the sun dropped. After six months. Konoha. With icy eyes, Danzo peered out over the village. To his surprise, the Demio had nominated a member of his family to the Hokage position, even though he had persuaded him to banish Naruto and remove Tsunade. Danzo now had to be careful because the council was making out with him. The prices of goods had been inflated by the merchants to the point where the people of Konoha had to work non-stop to make ends meet. Under Tsunade, the majority of the Anbu had retired or gone into teaching. The Chunin exam was held in spring country, and the remaining nins were essentially trained. 
Danzo sneered at people's ignorance. He was even kicked off the council by the new Hokage since he wasn't really needed to represent a dead clan and missing Nin. Danzo was enraged. Root had to retreat for the time being. Since Teki was viewed as a demon lover, he had been his last target for execution. More than anything, Setsui, the Hokage, was a pushover. He allegedly traveled to Konoha to wed Hinata and was upset to learn that she had left. Furthermore, the unexplained deaths of the elders of the Hyuga clan within a week of one another were written off as illnesses in the absence of a skilled medic nin like Tsunade. Sir, what are you orders? Fu stated. Fu, nothing. Maintain an open mind and ears. I'll restore Konoha to its rightful renown. Said Danzo. Fu gave a nod and vanished. Danzo raged as he considered his options, none of which seemed appealing at the time. All he had to do was wait. The Western. Their teachers had been training the former Konoha group. Amidst their training, Sakura, Ino, Hanada, Hanabi, and Tenten had given their all. They had received intense instruction from Tsunade, Kurunai, Anko, and Gai in everything from combat to medicine. The girls trained to support their friends and disprove the previous village. Along with Naruto, Rock Lee, Shikamaru, Kiba, Shino, Neji, and Choji had been training. They had learned from Jiraiya, Asuma, Gai, Suande, Anko, and Kakashi. At this point, they were prepared for their first test in at least Jonin level. Near the secret camp, Riska had scouted a fortress that housed prisoners. To liberate the prisoners and start the battle to bring the West together, they would attack it tonight. Riska was informing them that they might be able to make allies with the prisoners. So, the information indicates that there are affluent inmates here. If they are not ruthless warlords, we might be able to enlist their assistance. Since they are slack in changing guards, the best time is during the night shift change. While the west is mostly covered in forest, the eastern side is more open. Stated Jiraiya. The group was paying close attention. Therefore, the guards will move from their positions to cover any distractions we stage. Regarding the diversion, Jiraiya remarked. The shadow clones of Naruto are useful. He doesn't need to be close to them and can make a lot of them. Stated Shikamaru. Everyone in the group nodded. Naruto had become a lean, muscular teenager after losing all of his baby fat over the previous six months. Shoji had also lost weight. Despite his weight gain, he had more muscle than fat. Lee had also started to put on weight. His hair had grown out of his bowl cut and was now shaggy, reaching his shoulders. Though still quite young in his own right. Like Ino, Sakura was starting to fill out. For their first test, they were prepared. Since Riska uses mystical arts in her style, she was unable to train them in her methods. Riska grinned while they conversed. She hoped to locate her own comrades who were being held somewhere. You seem eager to attack these forts, Riska. Could you tell me why? Sakura inquired. A warlord kidnapped some of my allies. I'm afraid the warlord might try to harm them, Riska stated with sincerity in her voice. But if your comrades were as strong as you, they should be able to get out of the prison unless. Ino replied. To make sure they don't, the warlord takes innocent lives. This is the reason why the West needs people who are strong enough to maintain peace. Said Riska. Naruto posed a question to her. Why weren't you captured with them? Naruto inquired. Riska turned to face him, her eyes brimming with pain. I felt a bad vibe from them, so I turned to leave. They were taken prisoner by the time I realized it was a trap. I gave the impression that my friends and I were alone. That was a week prior to our meeting, said Riska. Everyone in the group glanced at her. Didn't you want to help them? Kiba inquired. Yes, but if I had been captured, I wouldn't be able to get them free, said Riska. Could they be in this area? Jiraiya inquired. I'm really not sure. I severed all ties with them so they could not track me or devise a counterplot. I hope we don't arrive too late for the inmates, said Riska. The company studied the setting sun. It was time for them to relocate. They arrived at the fortress shortly. True to Jiraiya's intel, the guards were lax. Naruto summoned about 100 clones. He sent them against the opposite side to distract the guards. The fortress soon erupted into alarm. All guards ran to the other side. Soon, the group was over the wall into the fortress. 
After that, the group divided into three groups. Riska, Naruto, Kiba, Konohamaru Hanada, and Sakura into one group. Ino, Hanabi, Shoji, Shikamaru, Lee, and Konohamaru into another. Tsunade, Jiraiya, Kakashi, Kuranai, Gai, Anko, and Asuma into another. They quickly went to their assigned areas. They had yet to encounter the enemy. Guys, only three of my clones are down. Apparently these guys can't use arrows or are bad shots. Naruto whispered. Everyone in the group nodded. Suddenly a large prison was in front of them with three guards. Naruto made to make more clones but Riska shook her head. Not at all. Let's do this another way. If they see the same attackers outside and inside they may sound another alarm. Riska said as she began removing her cloak. Underneath her cloak, she had a tank top and pants on. Riska, like Tsunade, was very well endowed in the chest area. She hid her sword and her staff became a bracelet. She winked at Naruto. What are you doing? Naruto inquired. Riska smirked. Naruto, there are some ways that only us girls CA use. Haven't you learned anything from Jiraiya? A woman's best weapon is her body. Once I distract them, you attack. Said Riska. She walked out, making sure the guards saw her. All three grinned. Lose your way? We can keep you company. One said. Riska smiled and giggled. Oh, you are shy. I like them shy. The other one said. The third just grinned stupidity with blood running down his nose. The three never saw the kanais that ended their lives. Riska looked over them, making sure their spirits were pure. Sakura tossed her her cloak. The group ran into the prison. The stench of death and decay sickening. The group then spilled into pairs to tackle the prison's hallways. Riska and Kiba took the left, Sakura and Naruto took the middle and Konohamaru and Hinata took the last one. Kiba and Riska looked in the cells seeing nothing. Kiba ran ahead following a scent. He came to a huge cell with prisoners. One was wearing tattered black clothes chained by his hands, one was chained foot and hand and had a leopard print clothing, another had a gag on and the other was in some sort of stone prison. The others caught up to them. Riska inhaled. Are these your friend? Kiba asked. Yes, I didn't think they would be here. Let's get them out. Riska said, using the keys that they had taken from the guards. Riska opened the door and stood in front of the one with the gag. Demi, it's me, it's Riska said Riska. The man looked at her, trying to smile. She removed the gag quietly. The man called Demi smiled. If you had come tomorrow, we would have been gone. Kahani is going crazy being tried hand and foot. Get me free and I'll get the others free. There are more prisoners down there. Demi said. Quickly, Riska unlocked the chains and gave Demi the keys. Riska told him where the meeting spot was. Demi nodded and moved to free the others. Kiba had already moved down the hall. He came up on the cell. It held two men, brothers, from the look of it. Kiba's senses screamed Alpha and he knew that if these guys were free they would be very helpful. He picked the lock to face the older one. He was powerful to the point Kiba knew he could end him. He had a half moon on his forehead and purple stripes on his face. The man opened his eyes to look at Kiba. Here to torture me, maggot? The man hissed. Nope, here to get you free as long as you aren't part of this force here. Kiba answered. The man stared at him. A kid? HMPH, these monsters took me down what do you expect to do against them alone? Theon said. Kiba smiled. I'm not alone. I'm going to get you and your brother free. Then we are going to free all the others who are held against their will here. Said Kiba. Riska had caught up to Kiba. Her face was shocked as she saw who Kiba had found. Ses Homaru. Riska whispered. Ses Homaru looked at Riska. How did they get you two and where are the others? Riska asked as she and Kiba got the chains off Ses Homaru. Ses Homaru rubbed his wrists and then was beside Inuyasha who was unconscious from their treatment. Ses Homaru's normally expressionless face had worry etched on it. He had finally accepted his little brother and now he was caught in this place. Kagome and the others? Riska asked. They separated us. I think they took the girls to be sold as slaves. If you hadn't come today. 
We would have been sold off if you hadn't arrived today. Stated Sesamaru. He encircled his shoulders with Inuyasha's arm. Inuyasha had passed out from a drug overdose. Guys, this is troublesome. Naruto's voice came through the link, we can't exactly attack the warlord because he has a child hostage. Riska said something. On the way. Said Riska. After Demi set the others free, they reunited in the hallway. Demi, bring Inuyasha and Sesamaru to Tsunade. You are familiar with her. Inform her that you will meet there. Said Riska. Demi accepted Inuyasha's other arm with a nod. Come on, Kahani, join us. Where are Eric and Jack now? said Riska. Speaking up was Kahani, a stunning woman with golden eyes and brown complexion. They're at the gate, waiting for us. Jack believed it to be the best. She answered. Riska gave a nod. Akumaru, who had up until now been silent, gave a gentle woof. Kahani grinned. Your pup? Kiba was asked by Kahani. Yes, we are making an effort to improve. As the group hurried to the location where Naruto was, Kiba retorted, he is a part of me and I him. The group soon came across the ugly, faced, scarred warlord who was holding a young girl captive. It was Jagan and Kagome, massaging their wrists. A coward. A true AMN wouldn't cower down behind a kid. Naruto sneered. The man chuckled. Dogs eat dogs in this situation. I'll be safe with this piece of meat, and who knows, maybe I'll keep her around for some. Entertainment. The warlord spoke with an evil smile. Riska gave him a glare. Walking to Shikamaru, Kiba. Shika, you got a plan? Kiba inquired. He has the upper hand unless we catch him off guard. I, Shika got going. A small cat suddenly leapt onto the warlord's back and scratched his eyes. A H H H H H H R E E G G G G G G G G G G. My own vision. The warlord threw the child and yelled, "You mongrel!" Just before she hit the ground, Neji grabbed her. The cat sprang away from the warlord's attempt to seize it. The warlord was taken by surprise when a tiger emerged from the sky, severing his neck. Riska mocked the deceased man. Sakura called him a scumbag. After setting the fortress on fire, the group made their way out. Kagome held Rin in his arms. Sakura was knocked down by a black blur as the group was making their way back. Sakura stumbled and moaned. A figure with his hand extended materialized in front of her. My apologies, Hiei often forgets to look where he is going. A polished voice said. Sakura turned to face the voice, but she was distracted by the greenest eyes she had ever seen. Her heart began to race. The man who spoke was extremely attractive, tall, and had red hair and pale complexion. He gave Sakura his hand and assisted her in standing up. Thank you. My name is Kurama. You were knocked down by my friend Hiei. Thank you Kurama, I'm Sakura. Stated Sakura. Riska approached the two. Kurama, where are the others? Riska queried. A warlord has been attacking that area, so they made the decision to wait in the valley. Only Hiei and I arrived. Stated Kurama. Hiei leapt from the tree. If Pinky wasn't in the way I wouldn't have been late. Hiei laughed. Everyone in the group fell silent. Sakura gave Hiei a glare. Did he? Kiba questioned. Yes, Ino replied. Troublesome. Sakura then went ahead and gave Hiei a hard fall on top of her head. His ass was in the air, his face in the grass. Never. Call. Me. Pinky. Stated Sakura. All Hiei could do was nod. After that, the group heads to the campsite, where Tsunade has pitched a medical tent. Rin, Jaken, and Kagome went there right away to get checked out. Riska's friends left to clean themselves of the dungeon's stench. After that, the group presented all of the data they had managed to gather. Jiraiya entered while they were conversing and started to run for his life. A lioness was pursuing him, chasing him up a tree. Riska gave him a glare. You were peeping? Said Riska. Jiraiya answered, well. Yes. The lioness gave a growl. Kahani, please reverse. I'll take care of peeping Tom. Said Riska. With her golden eyes blazing, the lioness turned and faced Kahani. 
Riska's voice was icy as she spoke. Let's investigate. Yes, indeed. With a smile, Riska spoke. Jiraiya took a big swallow. I did indeed cast this spell. N.I.W. on a snooper. When the speaker of says, let that appendage which he thinks would shovel and shrink and never rise up. Riska let out a chant. Jiraiya gave her a stunned look. You. You'll remove it? Stated Jiraiya. Riska grinned. Perhaps not, perhaps. Do you prefer castration, or did I tell you not to peep? Said Riska. Then Jiraiya fled to his tent. The group gave her a look. Life lesson never be a peeping Tom. Riska revealed to the group. Ignorant of the red eyes watching them, they all nodded. They wanted to join the group and had followed their every step from the previous night, but would they be welcomed? The red eyes, oblivious to the person behind him, closely observed the group. A figure was suddenly thrown into the center of the group. Hiei leapt out from behind them, prepared for combat. The figure astounded Naruto and the others. Sasuke? Konoha? Danzo and the Hokage were in a meeting. The man was not so much a fighter as a politician. Hokage, I'm not sure why you requested to meet with me at such short notice. I have not participated as much in the council as you have asked. Said Danzo. The man appeared to be uninterested. Naturally, you haven't. I didn't see why the Uchiha, a deceased clan, needed to be represented. And they own a compound as well? I'm bringing in a new clan, so that will be used. They will be nins, of course. They can benefit the village and have a bloodline as well. My cousin is adamant about it, the Hokage uttered. Though Donzo's mind was filled with rage, his face remained neutral. To entice Sasuke back, he required the Uchiha compound. With a smile, the Hokage. Kanoha's ninth is no longer Sasuke Uchiha. He left the fire country six months ago, and those who did it were exiled so as to leave no trace. Said the Hokage. Danzo gave a nod. Of course it was a trying time and the daimyo was overrun with work. Said Danzo. Indeed. I want the Uchiha compound to be painted, furnished for the new clan, and cleared of everything that belongs to them. In three days, they will arrive, said the Hokage. Danzo lost his temper. Hokage, that is a job for Genin, not a man such as myself. Danzo spoke fluidly. What is your rank as a nin? With ice in his voice, the Hokage spoke. I am a Jonin. Jonin can be asked to complete D. Rank missions as long as he is not engaged in combat or other orders. The law is that. Though I want you to do it, you can assist and even take on the role of overseer. If you perform well enough, I might even reinstate you on the council. Said the Hokage. Danzo gave a nod. He would carry it out via route. Very well, I will start tomorrow. Said Danzo. Danzo walked out as the Hokage grinned. After Danzo left, a nin leapt out of the darkness. Do you believe that to be wise? Allowing him to obtain the Uchiha's secrets? Said the nin. What are the secrets? The Demio vault contains the Uchiha secret justice. There are only regular ones left. I'm suspicious that he was responsible for the incident that occurred six months ago. My cousin disputes it, of course, but I'll make that monster answer for his misdeeds. Does he have a daughter? Said the Hokage. Yes, one of his root agents gave birth to her later in life. He is unaware that she is his, said the Nin. The Hokage grinned. Transport her to the Demio for instruction. I'm sure the lady will train her. We can't let a player like that walk on the court, can we? Said the Hokage. With a nod, the Nin poofed off. With icy eyes, the Hokage observed Danzo making his way to his house. For the life you took 16 years ago, you will pay you monster. Said the Hokage. The Hokage then turned to face the picture of him and a stunning woman that was on his desk. He had been waiting for his chance to exact revenge for 16 years, and that time was almost here. He could wait a bit longer, he'd been patient enough this far. In the West. With astonished looks in their eyes, Sasuke looked up at his friends, or at least hoped they were still his friends. Sasuke. How the hell do you do? Tsunade screamed. Sakura approached and gave him a forceful slap. Damn, Sakura. According to Sasuke, Naruto approached him with somewhat cool eyes. How come you left Pito? 
Not enough force. Shaking, Naruto inquired. Sasuke cast his gaze to his feet. I. I wasn't even eager to leave. I was made by something. As though I was under control. I ran as soon as Kabuto turned around because he had a mission close to the wall. I had no idea that I would find you too. Everyone was talking about how I caused you to lose everything. I'm not sure how long I'll even be in charge. Said Sasuke. The group looks at one another. Kakashi said. You shouldn't have been forced to do anything against your will by the curse seal. Perhaps one more seal? Kakashi asked. That's when Riska spoke. Seal of curse? She inquired. Sasuke displayed his power. Riska gave it a glance. Her expression turned irate as she studied it. She touched it without saying anything, her hand glowing purple. Sasuke let out a pained cry. Riska persisted until something started to emerge from the seal. As the figure emerged from the seal, Sasuke suppressed a cry of exasperation. As Riska finished, a skull rose into the air. Sasuke collapsed forward, exhausted from the battle. The gang examined the skull. Riska beckoned her staff to come forward. And then the skull started talking. Bring the red. Eyed boy to him, the master ordered. Red eye boy is now fleeing. The master is crazy. Master intends. The cranium communicated. Riska spoke in a composed tone. Wraith, who is your master? With Violet. Glow in her eyes, Riska spoke. The specter gave her a look. I never divulge. Me. Good queen, please do not send me there. A small vortex of power that the wraith alone could see caused the skull to scream. Tell me, or you will go into the endless land. Riska spoke, her gaze icy. The person whose name is Master. I could have as many souls as I wanted, he said. The specter let out a scream. Then Riska sent the dark energy everywhere as she stabbed the wraith with her staff. Everyone in the group gave her a look. Remind me to never piss her off. Said Kiba. Everyone in the group nodded. Sasuke gave her a glance. How did you know? Said Sasuke. Riska said something. It was a binder seal, that was. It attaches the mark. Bearer to the controlled spirit. Furthermore, the bearer is powerless to oppose the spirit. This Kabuto is abusing powers over which he is unaware of the consequences. Said Riska. Something snickered from the woods. So, someone figured out my little tricks. From somewhere among the trees, Kabuto spoke. Kabuto immediately sent his cursed soldiers after them, so the group had to remain on guard. Come on guys, we can take these guys out. Said Naruto. The group made a full charge at the cursed soldiers. Kabuto didn't seem to care that the soldiers weren't up to par with the skilled group. He had his own motives for pursuing Naruto and Sasuke. He would use the seals to bind them to him after the cursed soldiers had worn them out. While the group was fighting, Kabuto laughed. He was laughing when all of a sudden a hand was around his throat. He was lifted up and placed in front of his assailant. Kabuto was afraid that this person could destroy him with a simple flick of the wrist as his ice. Cold sea green eyes were fixed on him. Like a leaf, Kabuto was thrown among the cursed soldiers. Kabuto lost control of his cursed soldiers and they vanished as he turned to face the person who had thrown him. A massive man with green eyes, a broad deep face, and wild auburn hair turned to face him. The man was muscular and at least 6 feet 5 inches. His arm was as big as Kabuto's entire body. Kabuto took another look at those eyes and did something he wouldn't normally do. He got his pants wet. W. Who are you? With fear in his voice, Kabuto spoke. The massive man spoke, his voice booming. I am Eric the Fire Country, home of Demio. So you've made plans for my clan to travel to Konoha as ninjas? I'm grateful. A small, elderly, and wise man said. Demio gestured with his hand. Never consider it. There is space there because the Uchiha outlived their use and defected. Additionally, I believe that there, just like in a forest, your bloodline will flourish. Declared Demio. Grinning, the elderly man walked away. A group of people in a caravan were waiting for him. Grandfather, are we really going to have a village to call home? A young girl inquired. We are, indeed, Kastui. Home will be the village hidden in the leaves. 
says the elderly man. A girl said something. Being a part of a village once more will be pleasant. Since our home in the land of the echoes was destroyed, we have been nomads. We will have a house now. How about our lineage? The female inquired. The elderly man chuckled. Heartlines are encouraged. Let's head to our new house now. There will be a new home for the Ibarra clan. Grinning, the man said. The caravan made its way to Konoha, their future home. A set of eyes, covered in tear ducts, observed the clan's departure. Now maybe he could find peace. He had no reason to stay after learning that his brother had been taken over the wall. With a cold gaze, he examined the abandoned ring and cloak. Having fulfilled his responsibility, he will now keep guard over his beloved brother. Kisame gave him a look. Are you heading? I'll also be there. Kisame spoke, removing the ring and cloak. That's not necessary. It's my responsibility to protect. You are welcome to remain here. Itachi stated. Kisame gave a head shake. No, I'm sick of people hating on me. I joined just to get rid of String Boy from my mind. Kisame stated. Running for the west wall and perhaps a second shot at life, the toe. You, boy, have messed with my ring giver. I'm Eric the Kingslayer. Death is the penalty for such a crime. Says the large man. Kabuto trembled in terror. Why am I afraid so much? This guy can be killed by my soldiers, but why can't I call them? Kabuto looked at the man, thinking. With a chilly expression, Demi emerged from behind Eric. You're wondering why you are unable to contact your soldiers. The solution is easy to understand. When you attacked Riska with Eric, you went too far. Eric can neutralize any threat to us with his one power. You'll regret it. I have no sympathy for you. Demi stated. Kabuto then understood that the legend he had heard was real and that the Kingslayer would kill the king if they accepted a ring from the queen, but they would serve the queen until death if they accepted a ring from another person. Kabuto trembled in terror. Then he would have to give him a call. Anyhow, he needed to work out. Grinning, Kabuto took a scroll out of his pocket. Summoning Justu, Eater of Souls arise. Kabuto yelled. From the scroll, a dark must emerged and quickly assumed the shape of a man. Are these for me, Kabuto? You shouldn't have you know, they're young and strong too. Absolutely not at all. What have you done, Kabuto? Each of us is doomed. The ghost cried out. Kabuto appeared taken aback. Riska moved ahead, her staff extended. Riska's eyes went cold and the staff began to pulse and glow. Then she gave the spirit a fierce look and thrust the tip of her staff into its chest. The ghost trembled, turning into a dark mist that vanished completely. Fear filled Kabuto's eyes as he glanced at Riska. Who the hell are you? Stated Kabuto. Glaring at him, Riska's eyes and strength flared. I am Soul Queen Riska Namikaze. You are doomed, too. Said Riska. Eric let go of Kabuto. The eyes Kabuto saw were the coldest he had ever seen. Everything whirled and transformed, and Kabuto beheld a lovely village teeming with vitality and laughter. Kabuto grinned in response. So tranquil. So ideal. Truly incredible. He was happy and warm inside as he watched a child run by. Then Kabuto saw the dead in the village engulfed in flames, with people frantically trying to escape. The happiness that was was replaced with screams of terror and pain. Gazing at Riska, Kabuto turned to face her in the village square. Those who are similar to you do this. You take a peaceful village, murder its residents, and use the captives in your research. You are a horrible, cruel person. You exist for yourself and for profit. It will be an inspiration to those who follow you, Kabuto. You're going to be my little warnings catalyst. Now, if you don't mind, let me speak. Said Riska. Unaware of the power engulfing his body and spirit, Kabuto listened. Kabuto was going to use Riska as her spy in sound, and she only saw Riska as his master from this point on. Then, Kabuto turned away from the group and crossed the wall again. Everyone turned to face Riska. Riska remarked, just needed a spy without him being a spy. Sasuke, you will need to begin training tomorrow if you truly want to train with us. Here, we're going to try to start establishing some kind of peace. However, I will personally tear you apart if you ever betray us again. Stated Tsunade. 
Sasuke gave a head nod. Riska shook her head as Eric cast a glance at her. Jack had been observing the action from a tree leaning against it. Jack, why didn't you help with the soldiers? Kahani inquired. It wasn't necessary. We also never know who might be looking. Besides, it was yours. Said Jack. Jack had sleek yet shaggy black and white hair. In addition, he had one gray eye and one blue eye. He stood about six feet tall. His complexion was flawless with a hint of tan. If he winked at a girl, she would faint. Kahani gave a head shake. For now, it's concluded. We should take some time to recover from the fight since we just saved you all. And tomorrow is still when we need to meet the others. Said Riska. Riska slammed her staff into the ground, but the group still agreed and started to arrange for guards. Before long, the camp was covered by an invisible power shield. We all need to sleep, as I've said. Tonight, the staff will provide security. Getting her point across, Riska said. After that, each group went to their own tent. Riska stepped into hers and sensed something inside. Demi, you need rest too. Said Riska. Demi left the corner, his expression expressionless. He moved ahead. You are our leader, but when the warlord took us prisoner, we didn't succeed. The rings you gave us were the only thing keeping us safe from torture. Had we paid attention and persisted? Demi started to fade off. Riska put her hand on his arm. You believed there had been an assault. And that's the intended function of the rings. Keep the wearers safe and assist me in finding them. Demi, we have an opportunity to halt some war, if not all of it. Said Riska. Demi gave a nod. He was aware that they would soon be discovered. Laying on her cot, Riska's thoughts drifted off. We can now begin to repel the evil. Riska drifted off to sleep, thinking. Konoha the following morning. The Hokage gave Danzo a look. Now that it had been painted and cleaned, the old Uchiha compound was prepared for the new clan. The Hokage grinned. It appears that you are capable of handling assignments. You'll take care of everything. I'll create a new department for you called infrastructure. Said the Hokage. Danzo grinned. All he needed was a little more time to persuade the Demio to appoint him to the council. He was able to wait. He will hold the position of Hokage. Once more, the Hokage spoke. Everyone is welcome to the new clan. They are currently at the gates. Come with me to meet them. Said the Hokage. Danzo gave a nod, then trailed the Hokage. Before long, the road was lined with nins and citizens alike. A large clan emerged as the gate opened. Leading them was an elderly man. Stepping forward was the Hokage. Greetings from your new house. Introducing the Ibarra clan to all. The leader of this clan, Ginju Ibarra, is a gentleman who also comes from a bloodline. With pride, the Hokage spoke. As they arrived in the village, the locals applauded. With great gusto, all of them led them to the Ibarra compound, which was once the Uchiha. Ginju faced the assembly. We appreciate you letting us in. We will now reveal our lineage to you. Ginju stated. He put his hands on the floor and gestured a little. Together with flowers and herbs, vines started to grow. Watching the vines, the villagers cheered. Danzo winced because characters like the Ibarra were difficult to manage within his software and hence of no use. But like everyone else, he welcomed the group. Ginju gave Danzo a quick look. It seems he has a secret talent. With that one, I'll have to use caution. I'll subdue him with Tetra. Ginju pondered. The peasants were laughing and toasty. Ginju entered the grounds of the Ibarra clan. The ubiquitous green and blue tones of Ibarra. Lord Ginju, this compound has been completed for your request. Are you happy with everything? Said the Hokage. Indeed, Hokage, it's flawless. Here, my family and I will be extremely content. We're going to the ceremony tomorrow to show our support for the village. Ginju stated. Shaking his hand, the Hokage smiled. After that, Ginju closed the gates and turned to enter his new house. Danzo planned to propose a few root agents to be his servants. He had to watch out for this family. They'd taken his chance to complete his collection and entice the Uchiha back. Danzo departed, intending to wait for his opportunity to gain support. Ginju peered through the secret door. His? 
do you want me to observe him? Says a stunning woman. Watch him, Tetra, I say. We don't need any mishaps, and he has hidden agendas. Ginju stated. Tetra gave a nod. Ginju enjoyed being here. The elders were determining the precise location for each person to sleep. To get this, he'd had to do a lot of preening and dealing. This creep would answer to the daimyo in the event of an emergency. Ginju grinned. He was at his house. Danzo strolled towards his residence. For the time being, Root was beneath the house and ideally out of sight and mind. Danzo came inside, with Fu standing by to greet him. Sir, the Hokage has taken a child of Suru and plans to send her to the daimyo. Stated Fu. Suru? And how does this impact us? Said Danzo. Suru asserts that her daughter is a root. She might expose us if we don't assist her in keeping her daughter. She intended to wed into a prominent clan, stated Fu. Danzo winced. Make a note of Suru. I'll advise her to consent to it, said Danzo. Fu pursued Suru with another root agent. Suru went inside the residence. Suru, your daughter is to be trained in the Demio household for the Hokage's orders. I concur with this, said Danzo. Suru said something. However, you expressed your desire for her to wed into the upper clans. Additionally, she has been trained to entice one of them. Stated Suru. She is also capable of seducing Demio or his sons. We just cannot let this opportunity pass us by. We can use her becoming his daughter. In. Law to further our mission, even if that happens. Said Danzo. Nodding, Suru. Naturally, my lord, why hadn't I considered that? I'll let her know to get ready. Stated Suru. Danzo gave a nod. The Hokage was observing Danzo and Suru through the crystal ball. So, you want to woo Demio and turn her into a concubine? Not a bad idea, hum. For the horsemen of the far north, we need a concubine. This girl is ideal. I will heartily suggest her for this. Said the Hokage. Danzo was going to pay for what he had done 16 years prior. He was aware that Danzo still had root, of course. He was therefore happy that Ginju arrived. Danzo was confident that he could subdue other clans, but the Ibarra clan was valuable and unpredictable because their lineage was in plant cultivation. The Hokage grinned. He would relish witnessing Danzo's disintegration piece by piece. There was an Anbu. Hokage, it's agreed that the girl will go. When would you like us to depart? Stated the Anbu. All right now. Take her to my cousin Demio along with this letter. He's got her waiting for him. If you hurry, you should be there by tomorrow. Said the Hokage. With a nod, the Anbu departed. The Hokage grinned. This girl was the solution to his cousin's genuine reluctance to give one of his daughters as a concubine. After receiving concubine training, she would be sent as a daughter of the Demio family. Danzo was unaware of the inner workings of the court. Had he, Setsui's family would never have been lost in that error that occurred 16 years prior. Had he been more refined, he might have hesitated before sending the girl. Setsui peered out the glass. A small group was leaving. Wave had replied in writing, lifting some of the tariffs, and a letter had arrived. It was opened by Hokage. Greetings, Hokage. Although it is superfluous, your offer to let our warriors train at Konoha is alluring. Since we feel that the land of the samurai is a better fit for our land and fighting style, we have already decided to train there. The citizens of Wave have decided to maintain the current tariffs. But as long as Konoha pays the tariff fees, we're willing to let them use our harbors. The Wave Demio consented to let us set our own taxes at the village level. The Wave citizens. Setsui threw the letter from him. Although Demio could force them to cut the tariffs, they chose not to. The power of even the Wave Demio is limited. Setsui winced. To make up for the lost income, he would have to permit trade between Iwa and Cloud merchants inside Fire Country territory. Naturally, Demio didn't give a damn as long as money was coming into his coffers in the village. A year following the exile, Shino, Kiba, Sasuke, and Naruto kept watch over the town. They entered the building first. Stories of kids going missing at night had started to spread throughout the lands. Given that boys were the ones going missing most frequently, the boys had made the decision to go first. There were those who blamed a warlord or a demon. Some people think the boys fled. 
Riska had managed to discover the village's name. If necessary, Demi, Riska, Tsunade, and Jiraiya would take second place. Naruto moved toward the inn nearest the entrance to the village. The group entered and saw that the few people present were staring at them. What can I do for you boys? Says the innkeeper. Speaking in a nobleman's manner, Sasuke spoke. I need rooms for myself and my entourage. Sasuke spoke in a haughty manner. The host grinned. I have two rooms available for such an esteemed gentleman, of course, noble sir. Take them to the rooms at the end of the hall, ledger. I'll soon send up some food, says the innkeeper. Following the man, the group entered the two back rooms. After leaving, Sasuke gave the man a tip. In order to track the innkeeper and others, Shino had already released a few bugs. Kiba was sniffing around to make sure there were no hidden traps. Naruto cleared the doors and sealed them with a silencer so they could talk without being heard. So, the scout is the innkeeper. Anyone who comes here with wealth or social standing is instantly targeted. And most of the boys who are kidnapped are merely pawns. Thus, the first in a line of kidnappers is the innkeeper and his friends. Shino spoke as his elders told him the innkeeper had hurriedly left for somewhere else. That's when Naruto spoke. All right, guys, let's bait the hook now. Just use shadow clone, Naruto yelled. Four clones suddenly materialized. Then Sasuke altered each clone's appearance. A knock on the door was heard as they were hiding. As clone Shino responded, gas erupted into the room, knocking him unconscious. After seizing the group, the abductors fled. As they ran through the streets, the real group observed from the roof. They soon arrived at a building bearing the letter, nay, and a very recognizable spiral leaf design above it. Everyone in the group was silent. Thus, Danzo is also encroaching on the west. Most likely, he is harvesting the kids to increase his route. We risk creating a more serious issue if we behave carelessly. Said Sasuke. Everyone in the group nodded. Naruto cast a chilly gaze at the structure. A slight wind gust attracted their attention. Tsunade, Jiraiya, Riska, and the others were here. When the group saw the sign, they all gasped at once. Oh my god, Danzo. We must eliminate these root. Tsunade gave a sharp hiss. Riska just grinned. Jack, Demo. Enjoy yourself. That was all Riska said. Demi walked to the building's edge and leapt off while grinning. Silently, he landed in front of the structure. Jack just went along silently. Demi, knocked, on the door with his foot and grinned. The disruption made the root nin scowl. As the dead boy's body was being dismembered, Demi's eyes fell upon it. Rushing into the room, Demi launched herself at the root nin. Justice was used by the root nin to counter Demi. You guys are monsters. These aren't even adults so these are kids. And you carry out this action. Demi screamed. A root nin had something to say. For Lord Danzo, indeed. The child will assist us in death if it is unable to do so in this life. They are merely temporary. Said the nin. Demi gave the nin a chilly glare. Useless? You are not. I suppose I should show the others now since I have been saving this. A swirl of black mist surrounded Demi as he spoke. The must twirled around him, and his hands turned into long, black claws. He raised two enormous black wings from his back. His eyes lacked emotion and were icy. The root nin looked astonished. They had never laid eyes on such a specimen. With a lethal voice, Demi spoke. Now you will see the true power of the warrior fairy Demilasnatha. Demi stated. Jack just took a step backwards while Demi flew into the ninjas. The root nins started to gesture with their hands, but Demi moved more quickly and broke their hands and legs. He distributed the suicide seal in the process. The nin realized they could no longer kill themselves, and they started to panic. The conflict ended just as swiftly as it had started. The ninnies recoiled in agony as Demi employed magic to intensify the effect. He approached the small body and covered it. Riska came in with the others. The children's souls calling to Riska, she glared at the nins. You're going to pay for your actions here. Both in life and in death. You have vowed a thousand times, and you will continue to do so until your soul's sins are forgiven. You won't like death now, but you will learn to accept suffering and fear. Not for a good long while. 
you'll discover what true suffering is like. Jack sent them to the head of the village. Inform them about the fatalities. That's exactly what Jack ran off to do. Riska approached the lifeless kid. She touched the cloaked body with her hand. Go in peace dear soul. Riska said something. With tears streaming down his cheeks, Demi assumed his regular appearance. They were only kids. They were worthy of life. These folks are filthy. Demi stated. Demi was touched by Riska's hand. Those who are at fault will pay a price. The West is starting to come together. It is necessary to remove such filth. Come on, we need to talk to the Elder. Said Riska. The guard arrived and was informed of everything. The root nins are dragged to the jail by the guards. They made their way back to the secret camp. The others had been engaged in instruction. Riska let the others explain what had transpired. With Danzo on her mind, she went into her tent. That's when she spoke. You, monster, shall pay for your transgressions. From the moment you shut your eyes until the first light of day. You'll be feeling the hurt you've brought upon others. You'll experience the agony. It will be impossible for you to wake up or end your own life. Said Riska. Then she went outside to join the others. Konoha. Danzo had recently received word that the plant he had sent to the Demio residence had been offered to the north as a concubine. He hid his anger, which was fury. Even though the Demio had done it before, he was unable to go against them again. Though Demio had already married her off, he still intended to use the girl as a means of dominating Demio. Then Danzo summoned Carby, his assistant, who was chatting with Tetra Abara. She was discussing the village with him. Carby, we need to go finish the painting of the wall. Said Danzo. He had to paint, fix, and clean the village because he was in charge of the infrastructure. Since the village was still three years away from graduation, there was no Genin. It seemed to Danzo that the Hokage was making fun of him. He was unaware that a thin mist was entering his body. Violently, he entered his office. Carby, what is your thoughts on Tetra Ibarra? Danzo inquired. Carby was a civilian trained ninja, but he was also easily controlled. Choosing him didn't seem as suspicious as picking a root ninja. Sir, I like her. Maybe I could get married to her. Stated Carby. Danzo gave a nod. Words alone could easily control Carby. He was still unable to divulge his secret. If Carby had married into the Ibarra clan, he would undoubtedly have a spy on him. Carby waved off by Danzo. Torun showed up. Everything appears to be proceeding according to plan. At the next festival, let one of your bugs accidentally bite the Hokage. I'll be Hokage without him, said Danzo. He had had enough of waiting. Setsui grinned as she heard the command. Dragon, the one he is talking to is Torun? Setsui stated. Indeed, Hokage. A person who uses poisonous bugs. Said Dragon. Setsui gave a nod. How should I handle him? A root left over, hum. I'll give Danzo a task that Torun must accept, and I am aware of his exact desires. Setsui stated. Dragon had a curious expression. Danzo was determined to win back the Uchiha family. He will send Torun if he learns of a specific Uchiha being in a certain location. When he does, have Torun listed as having a $1 million bounty in the bingo book. Tell them everything you know about him. Even his hidden nags, Setsui stated. Dragon gave a nod before vanishing. Then Setsui sent for Danzo. The elderly man came in. Danzo, I've heard that Sasuke Uchiha is in the region to the north of Suna. I was hoping you could recommend someone, since we can enter there with just one nin. Said the Hokage. Indeed. Torun is the nin I own. He excels in missions involving retrieval. Said Danzo. All right. Forward him, said the Hokage. Danzo grinned and nodded. He had a method for training a new ally. Taking the file, Danzo went off to find Torun. The Hokage grinned. He was going to pull a fast one on Danzo. He was going to have to pay a heavy price. Weary from his work, Danzo walked home. After eating, he fell asleep. Dreamscape Danzo. Danzo strolled through his community. As Hokage, he was in charge of everything. Screams and agonized cries suddenly reverberated throughout the village. Nins were killing everywhere. His origin. 
They never failed to attack, and Danzo was pleased until he realized they were coming toward him. They did not respond when he called out to them. They did not respond to his command. Then Danzo noticed the red eyes he was holding in his arm. You've stolen both our eyes and our lives. You have destroyed us. You'll endure the same suffering that we have. The voices spoke. Danzo strained to get conscious again. The Uchiha. The street had turned into a dead end when he attempted to flee. When Danzo tried to call for assistance, his voice disappeared. Danzo turned into an ant, and the members of the Uchiha clan turned into giants. They started showering his body with senbons, kanais, and fireballs. Danzo cried out as his body was ripped apart, only to be ripped apart once more. He heard an icy, cold voice speak in this. You shall pay for your transgressions. From the moment of I. Shitting until daybreak. The voice said. Danzo was being attacked again when he heard a voice that made him feel extremely cold. Danzo repeatedly prayed to wake up while screaming as he was being torn apart. West. Riska grinned wryly and glanced east. Danzo was starting to experience the effects of her incantation. She wouldn't do it every night, of course. She would allow him to settle into the belief that it was all a bad dream, and he would eventually forget. However, Riska didn't. She was aware of the person responsible for the Namikaze clan's demise. The only people who survived were herself and Minato. How in the world could someone let such a creature loose? After sending Minato to be raised in a village she trusted, she had picked up the sword that no one had ever dared to touch. After three years of learning, she set out to destroy the creature that had been let loose in the western region. Along the road, she had come across a wicked witch that she had killed with the fabled soulfire. She had to give up something that most people take for granted, but Riska had challenged her and prevailed. Along the way, she had made friends who could support her on this mission. All of them destroyed the creature. The one item that most people cherish was also lost by her friends. Riska's sword's glowing markings caught her attention. She was aware that the sword would always report to the real Soul Queen. The students had a training day the day after the group had defeated the Root Nins. Kakashi was training Naruto, Sakura, and Sasuke on how to blend in while they were with him. Naruto had switched to a more conventional nin suit in place of the orange jumpsuit. He wore goggles with a black tank top, black pants, and black sandals. Sakura had changed into a pink shirt and black pants instead of her red dress and shorts. Sasuke continued to dress in his signature black attire. They were using their chakra while hanging upside down. Kakashi moved in their direction. Stealth is a shinobi's first priority. To separate themselves from the throng and become part of their surroundings. You can scout the enemy without them noticing you if you can keep your chakra stable. Compared to the other exercises we have been doing, this one is more challenging. You must use your chakra not only to support yourself but also to prevent blood clots from forming in your brain. Stated Kakashi. Sakura remained the greatest at controlling chakras, but Sasuke and Naruto were closing the gap. Then Kakashi started jumping on the limb, making it tremble. When they lost contact, Sasuke and Naruto collapsed. Sakura came right after. Hey, Sensei, why did you do that? Huffing, Naruto said. As a shinobi, you have to be ready for anything at any time. You performed admirably today. We will carry on with this instruction tomorrow. Kakashi came to a stop when two figures moved toward them. Sasuke fixed his gaze on the smaller of the two. He instantly fell in behind his allies, prepared to fight. Kakashi signaled for them to wait by waving his hand. The figures moved closer to Kakashi. Hi there, Kakashi. I hope our last meeting hasn't made you angry. Well, no, given that you were an agent of Jiraiya. Itachi, how did you find us? Stated Kakashi. Itachi grinned. I kept up with the gossip. All that's left in the east is scum, which is why I left. Kisame came along with me. We've heard that you moved to the west. Thus, we oblige. Itachi uttered a quiet word. Then Kakashi started talking. And you came here because. Kakashi started, but he was distracted by a howl. The howl was one to which the group was accustomed. Kakashi turned to face the noise. Come on, if you'd like to join us. It was Kiba. An attack has occurred. Let's head out, said Kakashi. Everyone ran toward the sound. They soon had a clear view of everyone else. 
Hinata was gasping for air, Kiba had cuts all over his face and arm, and Shino's left arm hung uselessly. While the others attacked the group, Kuranai battled two of the attackers. Sasuke, Sakura, Kakashi, and Naruto leapt in the middle, sandwiched between the attackers and the others. One assailant, wearing a long, gray gown, laughed. More people to murder. Master told you to kill each other before you killed him. Someone mentioned charging Sakura. Sakura grinned and sent the man flying with an uppercut. Naruto grinned as Sasuke took out his kanais to battle. Shadow clone justice. Said Naruto. There were soon 20 or more Naruto's present. The men in robes started fighting the clones. Sasuke had a fiery gaze. The men continued to attempt to combat the Naruto's. One managed to get to Sasuke's back with a knife. In an instant, Itachi activated his eyes and threw himself between Sasuke and the assailant. The man passed out. Sasuke noticed this as he glanced around. The brothers then joined forces to fight, and the men were soon vanquished. Someone smiled. Our boss will take us to task. We'll get our revenge. The man growled. Then the men started to dissolve, as if they were liquid. Before long, only faint vapors of mist remained. Kakashi turned to face Itachi, who had come to from unconsciousness. Kakashi moved toward him. You are not a member of the group. They vanished from sight. You are a person. Stated Kakashi. The man was attempting to escape the group by crawling. My master is my servant. I won't turn on him. The man uttered. Kakashi gave him a questioning glance. Itachi stopped the man from biting into his collar. Cyanide. To take your own life in order to shield the sender. Sorry, but it's not possible. We require details. Itachi stated. Jiraiya, Tsunade, and Anko had joined the team. Anko grinned and cracked her knuckles. Let me try a little persuasion. Anko smiled and said. The man experienced cold. He attempted to retreat, but Anko quickly caught up to him. He was drugged into the woods by her. The man started screaming, filling the room, and then he started speaking. In the northern quarter, the warlord Gui is my master. The lands that have been set free are his to conquer. He has promised those who bring him the lands, 500,000 gold. The man let out a scream. The man's screams stopped, and the group fell silent. Anko left without spilling any blood. Anko, you said you were going to use persuasion but you aren't bloody. Said Kuranai. This guy is afraid of snakes. Satu let out a childlike shriek when I called him out. When Satu bit him later, he revealed everything. He is not dead. Said Anko. Itachi and Kakashi exchanged glances. Tsunade looked over at them. Kakashi, could you please explain Itachi's presence? I believe he was a kill right there, Nin? Stated Tsunade. Before Kakashi could say anything, Jiraiya spoke. Itachi was my spy, Tsunade. Itachi has worked for me ever since the clan was slaughtered, Jiraiya remarked. Eyes serene, Sasuke turned to face his brother. Why did you murder our relatives? You were trusted, Sasuke remarked. Itachi approached him. I didn't kill our clan, Sasuke. It was Danzo's order. I was attempting to get Shisui's eyes back. Danzo had them abducted. The family had passed away when I returned. Itachi stated. I noticed you near mother's corpse. The knife that killed her was in your possession. Said Sasuke. Itachi resumed her speech. Mother looked like that to me. I had reached over to take the knife out. I should take care of you, she said. You then caught a glimpse of me. I made you hate me because I knew the person who was responsible would try to kill you too, Itachi uttered. Danzo murdered our relatives? Why not? Sasuke inquired. I'm not sure. I became Jiraiya's spy after sending word to him after leaving the village. I didn't intend to cause you any harm. Itachi tapped Sasuke on the head and spoke. Glancing up at his brother, Sasuke gave him a bear hug. I was aware of it. I was aware that not every clan member could be eliminated, said Sasuke. Though shocked, Itachi gave the hug back. So, did Danzo eliminate the Uchiha? Why? I believe they were preparing for a coup. Stated Tsunade. A sensei cover story. I have no idea why Danzo killed the clan. Stated Jiraiya. Well, 
let's focus on the warlord for the time being. The others will want to know what transpired, stated Tsunade. The group turned to leave. What about the man? Naruto inquired. Kisame turned to face the forest. Perhaps someone ought to, Kisame remarked. Not necessary. I returned his cyanide to him. Said Anko. They proceeded towards their camp. There, the others were in wait. Shino, Kiba, and Hinata were sent to lie down. Riska had been waiting for their return, preferring to stay out of the way unless absolutely necessary. The group was soon informed of everything. Jack was very silent. So your clan was wiped out by this freak? I'm also intrigued. It would be insane to wipe out a whole bloodline. Stated Kahani. Demi said something. It's peculiar. There must be a rationale. This thing accomplishes nothing to benefit other people. Demi stated. Riska pondered. Danzo had plans to execute the entire Uchiha clan if he gave the order. However, he wouldn't. However, it would account for many of the events of the previous year. Is Danzo tampering with deceased people's bodies? Riska considered. Tsunade uttered, Earth to Riska. Oh, I'm sorry, I was lost in thought. Said Riska. Itachi recalled the Soul Queen legend instantly. I'm honored to meet you. Itachi bowed and spoke. Riska grinned. That is not necessary. Give me Riska. Says she. Everyone was soon introduced. Tenten loved to boast about his interest in Kisami's sword. Itachi was closing the distance on Sasuke. Jiraiya had sent Naruto off to train. Sakura and Ino were receiving medical training from Tsunade. Riska cast a cold glance out of her mind. This raised some concerns. This Gwei was reputed to be a monstrous creature. They required an espionage agent. A figure suddenly leapt next to her, but she did not try to resist them. Riska said, Hello, Hie. Phew. At the camp are Yusuke and the others. We became aware of the assault. What are your desires? Hiei inquired. Riska let out a sigh. A spy is what we need. One that Gwei would never suspect. I'm not sure who that is. Said Riska. Hiei grinned. I think Yusuke might know of someone and they would probably be overlooked by Gwei. Hiei remarked. Riska questioned, who? Well, Yusuke informed me that someone owes him a few favors. Although Gwei's house would gladly welcome them, I'm not sure if you could persuade them to go. Said Hiei. Yusuke and Kurama could, said Riska. We could do what? Said Yusuke. Riska expressed their thoughts to them. Well, they could. He detests such monsters, so I'm sure one would. Stated Kurama. Riska gave Kurama a smile after nodding. Don't you have a date with Sakura tonight? Riska made a joke. Kurama gave a quiet smile. Yes, I do. Please pardon me, stated Kurama. Hiei gave a headshake. Hiei, didn't you say Tsunade needed your help with something? Said Yusuke. Glancing away, Hiei left. Yusuke gave Riska a look. I know he'll do it but I don't know about him holding his temper. Said Yusuke. Riska gave a nod. Where's Jenke? Riska inquired. Shikamaru and I playing shogi. I'm not sure why neither can succeed or fail. Said Yusuke. Riska peered out over the camp. As it turned out, Shika and Jenke were fighting a game of shogi. The ease with which the younger ones had bonded astounded her. All she could hope for was an improved life over the previous one. The territories that are free. Torun was breathing heavily. Between Hidan and Kakuzu, he had been trapped. Torun was a part of Hidan's ritual. Torun was unable to move or control his bugs. Hidan ripped his blade through his own flesh with such joy that Torun let out a scream. Yeah, yet another offering to Jashin. Haha. <laughs> As he stabbed the heart, Hidan spoke. Along with his bugs, Torun's screams turned into gurgling, bloody gurgles as he passed away. Then Hidan concluded the right. Kakuzu advanced and severed Torun's head. The head is all I need. Give the buzzards the body. Stated Kakuzu. Hidan started to leave with a smile. At the bounty office, Kakuzu turned in his head and was given the bounty. Kakuzu left in happiness. This death would satisfy the pain. 
He needed money, but for the time being he had to abandon his plan. Hedan remained ecstatic. The head was sent to Konoha for burial by the bounty office. The Hokage gave it a look. With his eye on the head, Danzo walked into the office. Is this the nin you sent? Said the Hokage. Inside, Danzo was enraged, but on the outside, he appeared calm to Torun. Hokage, if this was done by the missing nin. There was a bounty on your nin's head. Were you aware of this? Said the Hokage. Not at all. I didn't. Danzo uttered. The Hokage gave a nod. Transport the ashes to be cremated. Tell his relatives, said the Hokage. To the lab, Danzo brought the scroll. Torun's body was free of bugs. Reaching the incinerator, Danzo threw Torun's head inside. He would need to exercise caution. The only person he dated who was honest was Torun, and now a foolish bounty hunter took his life. Danzo peered at the tower of Hokage. Now he would really have to watch out for the Hokage. Now, the plan to make him Hokage was shelved. He was going to wait. The secret weapon would not be available for use for another year, as he examined his arm. Danzo turned his wrath toward the village. The Hokage smiled. The dominoes then started to fall. Like he did to you, I will denigrate and humiliate him. You were taken from me by him. You were in good health and happiness. Danzo sent you as an envoy dummy knowing that you would not survive our planned marriage. I'm never going to forgive him. Never. While holding the photo, Setsui spoke. He would cause Danzo years of suffering. He would feel regret for the days in town when he wrecked lives. He was really hoping to become Hokage, but fortunately Setsui took over. Despite Danzo still having the operatives, he disbanded Root, expelled Danzo from the council, and appointed him as the head of all genin jobs. Even though he planned to try to sneak into the council with the Ibarra clan, he was now a workhorse. But the head of the Ibarra clan was no fool. Setsui grinned. His strategy was bearing fruit. He found it amusing that Danzo attempted to make love to the leaders of the clan but was rejected. Regarding the two elderly crones who backed him, they were content in their retirement outside of the village. Setsui considered their current retirement home. Yes, that play really was excellent. As he observed the sunset on yet another magnificent day, he grinned. The Western. Sweat was all over Naruto's body from his training. He was learning how to manipulate Kayubi's chakra. Naruto grinned, recalling the moment he and Kayubi reconciled. Retrospection. Following an exhausting training day, Naruto dozed off. He was in what appeared to be a sewer when he opened his eyes. He heard growling and saw a pair of eyes as he made his way to the large gate. Well, it's my jailer. Enjoy life while you can brat. I am going to go and destroy Thai's freaks. As soon as I get free. The woman's voice growled. Naruto pointed to the number. Yeah, yeah. But you do realize that you would. Have to kill me to get out or at least that's what Jiraiya Sensei told me. Naruto replied. The figure approached the gate's terminus. The fox asked, Kyu do you know Jiraiya, brat? Naruto remarked, he's one of my teachers. Really? So he is alive? Then that means that the fourth Hokage did seal me and you brat. HMPH, I am unimpressed. The fox replied. The fourth Hokage was my father. He excised me because I was his child. Said Naruto. Really, you do resemble him but also. No. She died the night I was freed. Could you be Kashina's son? The fox inquired. The fox lowered his ears and turned to face Naruto. Kashina Uzumaki was my mom. Both my orants died the night I was born, Naruto said quietly. Wait a minute, brat. I see how you were treated because of me. But why are we not in the village? The fox inquired. I thought the clan I was supposed to protect had died out. But now I see there is one survivor. We are in the west because I was banished. My relative Riska Namikaze discovered us, and together we plan to bring the west together. Would you like to assist? Said Naruto. The fox gave him a quick glance. Kayubi, let me introduce myself. Yes, I will lend a hand. However, you must learn to combine the use of your and my chakras. Jiraiya will be able to instruct you in that. 
Kayubi remarked, I can also teach you a few justice that nobody else can do. Kayubi, really? Regards. Said Naruto, with a smile, before fading. Hi. What's taking place? Naruto inquired. Kayubi said, you are waking up, Kit. When Naruto awoke and told everyone what Kayubi had said, Jiraiya started teaching him how to control both Kayubis and his own chakra. Final flashback. As he left the training area, Naruto grinned and said, I need a quick shower and some food. He saw Hanada sparring with Hanabi. The two sisters were closer now and they sparred frequently. Naruto had to admit that the banishment was the best thing to happen. He was going to fix the West, one warlord at a time. It might take years, but he would bring the West together. He watched the camp while he thought. Sakura and Kurama were walking towards a village going on another date. Who knew that Sakura would fall for Kurama and Kurama for Sakura? Maybe because they were such opposites in terms of temperament. Hey Yusuke, how are you? Naruto spoke, and Yusuke smiled. I thought I had you, ah man. I was going to do some recon with Kuwabara. Would you like to come along? Naruto leapt to his feet, eager to hear Yusuke say, this warlord is trouble, but nothing dangerous. Yes, perhaps we can obtain instructions on how to enter the stronghold he frequents. Naruto shook his head. Besides, I need to stretch my legs a little, he said. The three boys soon found themselves traveling to the fortress, where they hid in the trees. The area was dominated by a massive central building surrounded by walls, and both slaves and warriors were rushing back and forth. He thought, poor people. Then, out of nowhere, a massive man who must have been at least seven feet tall and equally broad entered. The dining room is prepared, master. Tonight we have some. New entertainment. Of both types, a man informed the enormous man. Well done. All right. The next sight made Naruto's blood run cold and his temper flare. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. It couldn't be. They are safe in the east. What happened? Naruto thought. Bring the first one. You know seeing blood run as I eat makes me happy. The warlord Gwe said. The man grinned and nodded. Kit, please settle down. Kayubi said to him, we need more help. Yusuke and Kuwabara turned to face Naruto. Are you okay? Kuwabara inquired. Naruto made to jump, but Yusuke stopped him, saying, no, those are friends of mine from the east and the other entertainment. I can't wait guys. They might kill them if you charge in. The others will arrive once I send out a flare. Then we attack, Yusuke informed Naruto. Naruto clenched his hands but gave a nod. Yusuke then sent out a flare, which Hiei, who had been left behind, noticed. Yusuke sent out a flare, everyone. They must have found something, Hiei remarked. Riska, Demi, Jack, Kahani, and Kakashi immediately fled to the trees, with Eric serving as their final line of defense. When they reached the boys' location, Yusuke gave them a swift rundown. Naruto, who is it? Tsunade inquired, and Naruto gave her a painfully icy stare. It's the palace of Demio. The girl's intention to marry into his family led him to marry her to the Prince of the North Mountains, where she would be kept as a wife forever. Setsui informed him that the village had made a new deal with some of the villages and the others still charged them heavy fees. The Demio would personally bow to those he wronged and beg forgiveness. He looked over a few papers trying to ease his mind. Fire Country had lost so much that day. Perhaps they were living a happy life. All he could hope to do was apologize for the wrong that he committed and ask for forgiveness. Konoha. Setsui came here as a favor to the Wave Demio and at last got a meeting with the Spring Demio. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to Konoha, Lady Demio. Though Koaiki gave him a stern look, Setsui stated, please enjoy your stay. He wasn't the one in command. I'm going to be leaving this meeting soon. Say what you want to, Koaiki sternly said. I am aware that the exile that was imposed a year ago resulted in significant difficulties. Setsui uttered, I was hoping that you would permit our merchants to pass through your lands. You're quite bold. The one who saved the spring country was banished by your daimyo. Without a chance, without a trial. And you intend to make use of my nation as a springboard. Okay, I'll accept it under one condition. A 500 gold tariff will be paid for each load of goods that travels through spring from Ortokonoha. 
The load will belong to the Spring Country merchants if it is not paid for. I'm in on this, Koike declared. I concur. Setting his signature on the paperwork that Koike's assistant had given him, Setsui stated, as long as we can get the goods to Konoha. All right. I'm heading out now, Koike declared as she left the room, eager to get away from Konoha's stench. Had it not been for the kids, she never would have accepted the arrangement. She hurried with her guards, knowing that a messenger was waiting for her at camp. What's new? Koike inquired of the man. Not good news, but the rumor has been verified. Konoha and Suna are once more in communication. The man waved Koike away, saying, I don't know why Gara would do this but he did. Something wasn't right. Gara would never betray Naruto in such a way. What's going on? Koike wondered as she read the other messages. A man sat waiting for his chance in a nearby tree. She was the target his master wanted, and he would get her. The man didn't notice the other figure watching him. Quietly, the figure crept up behind him and slid his throat. The man died quickly and quietly, and the other figure fled back to the village in the Ibarra compound, where Ginju was waiting for him. You performed admirably. You have demonstrated your allegiance to the Ibarra clan and the village. Karbi, you can wed Tetra. Ginju uttered. I worked for the Ibarra family in the village. Thank you, grandfather. Karbi said. Ginju left. He had Samin. The man followed the spring to Mio and sent Karbi who they had been training to kill him. The thorn knife already destroyed. Danzo was indeed a monster. Elsewhere, Danzo waited for the nin to bring the woman. He waited as long as he could before sending out a searcher. The searcher returned an hour later, a dead man in a seal. Danzo told the man to destroy the body and left fuming. The spring de Mio was out of his reach now and his plan halted. But at least Suna was trading with them again. That was a plus. Now if he could just get Dagara and, retrain, him his plan would have a true ace in the hole. The group gasped when Naruto said, it's the Sand Siblings. How? Gara was Suna's cage. Unless something went wrong, but how were they apprehended? Tai deserved better, so Tsunade asked, her temper flaring. Naruto was trembling. Rick, Kiba, Shino, Shoji, and Shikamaru were also pissed off. These warriors had gone from being Sasuke's enemies to his allies. I believe I can respond to that. These chains transform the energy that one expends in combat into harm to others. The group watched as Kurama spoke, if we don't get those chains off first, they will use the powers against the others. It's only logical to assume that they would kill Tamari and Gara if we wait any longer. We have to leave now. With that, Naruto leapt over the wall, and the others did the same. Intruders. Launch an assault. People were fleeing. Shikamaru grinned and used his shadows to create a wall. Shino then covered the wall with his bugs. The men screamed as the bugs chewed them up. Shinon had created a new bug that only attacked the ones causing trouble. Another group of men attacked Tsunade. A man said, Sasuke silenced him with a kanai to the eye. Hey, those tits are nice. The man said, if you become the warlord's sex slave, I'll spare you. Tsunade grinned and punched the man in the groin, sending him flying into the air. The other men flinched as Tsunade smiled hearing the uncouth shriek as the man vanished. Next up, who? The warlord Gwei was always standing at the front of the hall with a devious smirk on his face. Naruto, Kiba, Rock, and Sasuke made it to the main entrance. Two guards tried to stop them but were quickly dealt with. The men looked at each other and then started running. Tsunade punched the ground, stopping them. Let's play, boys. Come on. Roll the blood, please. Gwei yelled, yanking a massive double axe off the wall and swinging it toward the group, causing Rock and Kiba to roll to the side and Naruto and Sasuke to leap into the air. Sasuke landed in the center of the axe, feeling uneasy about it, so Gwei raised it, causing Sasuke to jump clear. Lee, Kiba, pursue the sand siblings. Naruto and Sasuke landed some distance away from Gwei and his axe. Kiba and Lee ran after the other men hauling the siblings away. We'll hold this guy off, Naruto declared. Naruto, that man isn't normal. It seems like the axe is the master. We may break their bond if we attack the axe, Sasuke remarked. 
All right, replied Naruto, before hurling some kanai at the axe and using Sasuke's fireballs to destroy it. The attack left Gwei bloody and burned but left the axe undamaged. Naruto, charge at the axe. Sasuke gave a call. Go ahead, Rasengan. The fighting had stopped, and the boys simultaneously exclaimed, Kaden, fireball. As the attacks started to combine, Naruto's Rasengan started to draw the fireballs into itself, growing larger and hotter as it went. Gwei glanced at the attack and uttered a single word. F asterisk K. Together, the two said, combined attack, fire Rasengan. The heat increased as the attack struck Gwei and his axe, causing him to scream as his flesh melted away and throw the axe out because, as his body died, his soul entered the axe. Sasuke saw this and sealed the axe with sealing papers. The boys heard this and went into defensive mode, only to realize that Kiba and Lee with the Sand Siblings were running towards them, holding Gara between Konkuro and Tamari. What took place? Naruto uttered. When one of the men mentioned making Tamari a slave, he broke the chains. Gara lifted up his head and said, he's tired but okay, Konkuro said. Let's go with the flow. Naruto remarked, you guys can tell us what happened in Suna and why you were here. The night before we were said to depart, these slavers used seals on us and sold us to this place, which infuriated our Demio, who was upset that we had imposed such high tariffs and banished us because one of his friends wanted to be Cage. Because the chain absorbed chakra, we were unable to fight. We became weaker the more we used. These freaks then used chains that had an impact on us. We're happy you discovered us, Gara mumbled. Okay, you can aid in bringing the West together. Once outside, Tsunade approached the group, heard the story, and shook her head. Or at least try, Naruto said, and Gara grinned. Why are they acting in this way, Ba? Chan? Naruto inquired. I'm not sure. Maybe they thought Gara posed a threat, or maybe someone bought off Demio. But now that they're here, Tsunade remarked. The One Tails, what about them? Naruto inquired. Kit, I'll speak with him at night. Perhaps I could also teach Gara how to get along with him, Kayubi thought to Naruto. Okay, Kayubi, Naruto answered. The group arrived at the group of trees where everyone else was. The story caused those who didn't know the siblings to become ill and those who did to become angry. Thus, he was exiled for standing up for his friend. Riska said softly, oh my, how far the east has fallen. Kahani then spoke. Now what should we do? Riska looked east as Kahani spoke, this Danzo is not going to let go so easily. Until he is cage, he won't move. He intends to pursue that role as quickly as possible. But Danzo won't have the foundation necessary to stir things up as long as there is a cage in charge. We'll allow him to knot his own noose. The two women stared to the east in the night sky, wondering what was happening to the villages, but Riska spoke softly. We will work on making this place better and if Danzo tries anything, you will see exactly what he lost. Suna. The cage of Suna looked out over the village. He thought that the cage job was easy but it involved so much ass kissing and flattering words. The merchants controlled the shinobi so he had to go by their rules. He had asked the Suna Demio for this position cause he wanted to control the village but he was nothing but a puppet. He hoped to marry Rasa's daughter but she was long dead. Rasa had killed his mistress when she threatened to tell his wife. Rasa killed the mistress and the cage thought the child was alive but she passed away in an attack. He was stuck here because of his own stupidity. At least he sold those brats off. He walked through the halls of the tower. Head opened up trade with Konoha simply because they begged. The terms were favorable for Suna. The merchants knew that they could bleed more more out of Konoha. The council basically were assholes and he was mad. This plan of his failed but he had time. A figure watched the cage as he walked into his office. The figure then jumped away onto a clay bird, flying away to the hidden hideout. Did you verify the reports that the One Tails is no longer in Suna, Didera? Payne inquired. True enough, he's no longer there. How should we proceed? Didera inquired, and Payne turned to face the villages. We'll hold out. We've been waiting for a while. Payne said, we can wait a little longer. He then vanished from his office. Conan, everything is not working right. It was all laid out for us. Payne said, send Zetsu to the Cloud Village. 
That's not going to happen, Conan stated. Why? Has he not come back? Payne inquired icily, and Conan spoke once more. Conan replied, yes and no. Conan, please tell me. Payne spoke firmly as Conan approached a box that was resting on a chair. Without saying anything, she opened it, and when Payne peered inside, his heart stopped. Zetsu was dead and dismembered, which bewildered him since he was a plant. Based entity and no one could have sensed him. And tell everyone to remain in their current location. We'll keep quiet for the time being. Conan nodded to the left, and Payne stared out the window, staring at the rain. Payne had to go back and reconsider this plan. Even though he didn't go into that west, he had heard that there were those over the wall who make the cages look like Genin, so if that's the case, he would have to wait until the opportunity to fulfill his dream presented itself. Zetsu was ecstatic. Without much effort, he had sneaked into the west. He planned to surveil and locate the creatures with tails in order to return to pain. Then he could return his mother to him. He was certain he could easily defeat the ninjas. He saw the red. Haired boy and the pink. Haired Nin appear. Zetsu melted into the darkness, observing and biding his time. Sakura and Kurama were talking about how they were going to improve and unite the West. That had made Kurama smile. You do not care that I'm a fox demon? Most girls run away. Kurama replied. Sakura approached him and lightly kissed his cheek. Naruto has one in him. I have learned that it's the person's heart and soul that make them who they are. And you said your Yoko likes me. Sakura laughed. He likes the fact that you were kick-ass. And you knock Ye out the first time he called you that word. Kurama said with a grin. A cold wave suddenly passed over him. His expression barely altered, but Sakura understood what that implied. What is it? She murmured. Be alert. We are being observed. Kurama declared. Sakura nodded and grinned. Kurama wandered in the direction of a cafe. Zetsu was staring at them so closely that he failed to notice the creeper vines encircling him. Zetsu was abruptly drawn into a field and out of the shadows. There, waiting, were Kurama and Sakura. Who are you? inquired Kurama. With the intention of frightening the two with his plant. Like abilities, Zetsu exclaimed, I am Zetsu. I serve the great pain. Give me the tailed beasts. Kurama burst out laughing. You come here to destroy, but do not realize that I am a master of plants. I will teach you the difference between true power and fake power. You will be our message to the east, Kurama continued. Zetsu attempted to use his ability to remove the creeper vines, but it was unsuccessful. He was also unable to split into two separate forms. Oh, I see. I neglected to mention that these plants are demons. They don't report to people like you. I'm sure you'll get it shortly. You will now be the information we need on this pain, Kurama uttered as the creeper vines encircled Zetsu even more tightly and sent tendrils into his consciousness, absorbing all of the knowledge he had. Nah. I'm going to use the monsters to get my mom back. Kurama had all he needed from the creature, but Zetsu spoke the words that would ultimately determine his demise as he fought the vines. I'm going to get even. Forever, that bitch with pink hair will be my F-O-O-D-D-E-R. Zetsu started laughing until the eyes met, and in those calm green eyes, Zetsu saw the world of hurt he was in for. Zetsu screamed, believing that Kurama would stop to protect her. Nobody puts my Sakura in danger. I'll give you pain because you want pain. Sakura was observing from a distance due to the creeper vines, and she knew that the spy had truly enraged Kurama due to the shift in the atmosphere. Sakura shook her head as Kurama snatched up the two plant. Like leaves on either side of Zetsu. What would happen if I tore these off, I wonder? Zetsu paralyzed as Kurama spoke. You wouldn't. Zetsu started, and then Kurama ripped off the two attachments that resembled leaves in one enormous rip. Zetsu screamed as his shield was torn away from him. A-A-G-G-G-G-H-H-H-H. As his blood dripped, he knew it would create a smaller version of himself. What he didn't know is that a demon creeper vines needed one thing to grow stronger. Zetsu laughed as he was bleeding. Kurama tossed the pieces to the end of the creeper vines and it ate them. Zetsu then understood that he was going to die here but he could at least get a small piece of himself to warn pain. Kurama smiled as Zetsu said, I will survive. 
you will, of course, as my servant. But as for this body, Rose Whip, Kurama said, twisting a rose into a whip. He then began to whip Zetsu, causing chunks of flesh to fall off as he did so. Zetsu's screams filled the air, and he realized that he was being flayed alive. Zetsu screamed for mercy, and Kurama stopped. Zetsu was no longer a being. His body had been torn apart, and his face had been ripped and smashed. Kurama then remembered the plants, and Zetsu looked like a jigsaw puzzle with many missing pieces. Kurama had only left his shoulders and head intact enough that his master would be able to recognize him. Kurama made sure to suck all the blood and chakra out of the body. With a new plant in his arsenal, Kurama went off to the cafe with his partner, saying, let's finish our date. Konoha. The Hokage had attempted to marry him off to an elderly hag of a noblewoman. Fortunately, the lady refused. Danzo was incensed. At least he could have attempted to marry him into the clans. He was incensed as he saw more requests for walls to be patched, gardens to be weeded, and roofs to be built. The teachers had failed the genin in training once more. Danzo fumed. His root would do whatever he asked of them. The clans would be against him if he started trouble now. Time was all he needed to become cage. A little more before his dream came true. Sounds. Orkamaru was furious. He had been for a while. Unable to find someone to take Sasuke's place, he turned the blame on Kabuto, who accepted his punishment and was now searching for a new corpse. Orkamaru hissed, anything. Itachi is nowhere to be found. Before Sasuke left, I should have gotten some samples from him. Kabuto remarked, we could have bred a new body. Oh my goodness, what a shame. All we need to do is locate one. He 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 he, Orkamaru exclaimed from his bed. Kabuto went to his own room and sat on the floor, realizing that he had to find a body or else his own head would be chopped off. Rainfall. Conan planted Zetsu in the best soil. They would have to wait for about a year and he would sprout anew. They had waited for years another six months wouldn't hurt. Pain needed all the tailed beasts for his plan to succeed. Even catching one would be useless. But he had to keep an eye on them. Pain told Conan that Zetsu should be reborn because he was a plant. Based Entity. Cloud. I had called B into the office because he was worried about his brother and had heard that there was a group chasing the tailed beasts. Hey, how are you, bro? B gave him a rap, and I put him in a headlock. You've addressed me correctly. Said A, B gave a nod. A group is out hunting the creatures with tails. Until I leave, you are not allowed to leave the village. You get it? A uttered. Understood into hood, B rapped. A sighed and motioned for him to leave. Since Konoha had banished some nins, it had been a storm of problems. Sure, the merchants were happy, but the shinobi wanted a bloodline in return. Konoha's demio had refused, so the shinobi backed off. But they wanted blood. Iwe was the same way. That old man was shrewd and astute, knowing that Konoha was stirring trouble with their actions. He didn't trust that one eye advisor Tsunade had, but he had been removed from the council. Hopefully, he was placed in a less powerful position. I knew that these nins were responsible for some of the disappearances over the years. Perhaps one day he could find out what happened to the nins that went missing in the attacks after the second war. For now, he had to protect his people and his BR. West. A giggle cut through Naruto's training, and he saw Hinata standing there. Hina, are you making fun of me? Naruto uttered. No, I was savoring the scenery. Besides, we have a date tonight, Hinata remarked. Naruto grinned. The two had been dating for about four months after Hinata had taken a chance and told him how she felt. Naruto hugged her back, and they have been dating ever since. Naruto grinned as they made their way to the camp, where Tsunade and Jiraiya had gone to look into the matter of small girls going missing and returning with cuts and bruises. The group didn't like that, but couldn't argue with their reasoning, when a toad appeared. How are you, Gamakichi? Naruto inquired. Difficulty. Big trouble, said the toad. What took place? Hanada and Naruto spoke. Someone has abducted Jiraiya. Lady Tsunade informed us via Slig. She's going to retrieve him. Naruto got to his feet as Gamakichi remarked, that you discovered that the nomad warriors have him. All right. I'll let everyone know. It seems like our date is postponed, Hina, Naruto remarked. 
Hanada nodded. The two ran into camp while yelling. Naruto informed the group right away. Riska said something. So, they were the cause. It's a good thing Tsunade decided to go, she remarked. Why? Naruto inquired. Because the nomad warriors are descendants from the ancient Amazons. Riska replied. Amazons? Kiba asked. Warrior women who are prepared to fight. They only associate with fertile men. The strongest queen among them all is theirs. Taking down the queen is the only way Tsunade can save Jiraiya. Jiraiya will become their slave if she is unable to do so, according to Riska. And if the queen is vanquished by Bachan? Naruto inquired. She will then become their queen. They follow one rule, Riska remarked. What is that rule? Kiba inquired. You keep what you kill. You keep what you kill. The group fell silent, realizing that although Tsunade was a skilled fighter, it would be difficult to determine a winner against such an unknown. We ought to visit them. They'll require assistance, Riska said. Bah. Chan is going to be fine. She must be. Riska gave Naruto a gentle pat on the arm and said. Tsunade is a fighter. However, it never hurts to have support from others. I trust Tsunade, Riska uttered as the group entered the circle and Riska led them closer to the battle. Back in the village, Tsunade had located the kidnappers, who were concealed in a small forest area. She heard shouts and chants as she neared the camp and saw Jiraiya sitting quietly in a cage with bruises on his hands and face. A tall, muscular woman approached the cage. Dear sisters. This man has betrayed our goal of turning the resilient girl children into warriors. Tsunade stormed into the camp, saying, he is ours to keep or kill. The woman started to shout. The woman in the middle looked at Tsunade, who said, the man is mine. She wanted this one for herself, and this little woman claims him. Is that yours? Not any longer. The woman laughed at Tsunade and said, run along, little woman. Tsunade said, I said he is mine. I will be taking him and leaving. The woman snarled. Woman, you want to fight? The winner takes everything. Sisters, never forget who we are. I am your queen, and I shall triumph. The group, who had just arrived moments earlier, watched in silence as the two women strode away from each other. Then, the queen attacked Tsunade punching her until she easily sidestepped the blows and was pushed back, smiling as Tsunade looked at her with blood on her mouth and a smile on her face. Tsunade then lifted her hand to her face and healed herself, leaving the queen speechless. Tsunade then stood up, beaming at her. Now that I am aware of your abilities, bitch, I believe we can actually engage in combat. The queen looked up at Tsunade with a look of anger in her eyes, Tsunade said. Bitch, who do you think you are? Tsunade grinned as the queen let out an indignant scream. As a student of the third Hokage, a granddaughter of the second, and a granddaughter of the first, I am Tsunade Senju. A medical expert, a sanin, and one of the strongest women in history is me. The queen had been glaring at Tsunade until she heard this. And I'm about to wreck your world, Tsunade said in a deadly voice. Senju Tsunade. Like in the mythical slug princess. She's in the east, right? A woman spoke up, and the group started whispering. You are, then, the great slug princess of the east. I fail to see why you are so strong. That man is going to be a great slave for me, after I kill you. Those girls lacked strength. Tsunade grinned and said, you are no queen as I am. The queen spoke. It has been a while since my last big move. Against you, it's going to be fun, Tsunade uttered. The queen lunged towards Tsunade once more. Tsunade used her chakra to form a fist and struck the ground. The queen leapt up to avoid the hole, but that was not what Tsunade desired. She took a boulder and threw it at the queen, barely missing it but losing focus on Tsunade. The queen was momentarily stunned, which was a mistake. Tsunade started what the girls would refer to as the Senju beat down, pummeled the woman's face, upper chest, and body while the group was unable to keep up. After a few minutes, the queen fell heavily, and Tsunade landed roughly 10 feet away from her. It's finished. You come out short. Hostile people are frequently overcome by their hate. The queen managed to get up, her face blue, black, and covered in blood. I don't know what man did to you to make you hate them, but not all men should pay for the fault of one, Tsunade remarked. N. No. 
I'm going to kill you. The other female warriors observed the scene as Tsunade pulled her fist back and let the now dead queen drop. The queen charged at Tsunade, who channeled her chakra into her right fist, saw the hatred in her eyes, and shook her head. As the queen approached, Tsunade reared back, and the queen's face made contact with Tsunade's fist. The only sound was the tearing of muscles and tendons, and the queen's momentum and Tsunade's strength were so great that Tsunade's fist went all the way through her skull, pushing out blood and brains. All hail Tsunade the queen. As Tsunade released Jiraiya, the women around her knelt down, cheering. Jiraiya grinned, and Tsunade looked curious. Many thanks, Haim. One woman came up to them and said, I wanted to call out to you but the cage has a silencer spell. Jiraiya. What are your orders, my queen? She inquired. Tsunade was initially taken aback. The others arrived in the clearing. Jiraiya uttered words. That was the nomad warrior's queen, Tsunade. They follow one rule at all times, Jiraiya remarked. Just one rule? Tsunade inquired. Indeed, one. What you kill is yours to keep. Tsunade turned to face the women who were knelt, you killed the queen, so you are the queen, Jiraiya declared. How powerful are you? Tsunade inquired. One woman answered, 200 warriors. 200 fighters. No spouses or kids, Tsunade inquired. Husbands were not permitted for us. Just sexual slaves. They perished because she wanted to have fun. Although we are fighters, we also want families. Can we start a family, queen? A young woman said. I, your queen, hereby declare that you are free to wed the man if he is willing. But he needs to be a fighter. The nomad warriors have ceased to be nomads. Another name that exudes honor and pride comes to mind. We're going to be the Amazons. The women start yelling with happiness as Tsunade speaks, we will honor a name that has supported warrior women for a millennium and we will honor it every day. Jiraiya patted her shoulder. It appears that you have a devoted fanbase, Haim. This place is starting to come together. We will create a lovely home for everyone, even though it might take some time. Jiraiya grinned, the others were waiting, and Tsunade glanced at them. Tsunade looked into Jiraiya's eyes, saw something, and quickly turned away. And we will enjoy together, Jiraiya said. I suppose the camp is expanding. After the group moved over and introduced themselves, Riska said softly, with the Amazons, we have more to aid us in the fight for the West. Soon, everyone was back at camp, and Sesamaru appeared displeased. How are you, Sesamaru? Sesamaru spoke in an icy tone, and Riska asked as the others assisted the newcomers in setting up. In Porta Blanca, it's just as we feared. The, Lord, is stealing the goods while refusing to help the common people. Without money, you either starve to death or end up as someone else's property. Sesamaru said, the person we send in has to be extremely careful. Riska nodded. I've thought of a plan. I'll deliver a message to Yusuke. Going shouldn't bother him. I did, after all, give him another chance to prove himself, and I did the same for the big guy. Riska remarked, they'll fit right in. Sesamaru arched an eyebrow. Yes, until one of them gets ripped apart for crossing a boundary. Riska grinned as she wrote the note, but then again, that's the type of thing this creep likes, Sesamaru remarked. Finding Yusuke wasn't difficult, but dragging him away from plotting a prank on Jiraiya was. It will require a moment, Yusuke. Riska said, you can play pranks on Jiraiya later. Yusuke, his sweat drops dropping, approached her. Naruto comforted Yusuke, saying, don't worry, we won't prank him till you get back. Yusuke turned to leave. I need this delivered by you. He's somewhere you know. All the information he requires is in the letter, Yusuke I bring Keiko back with you. Without you, I'm sure she's growing a little lonely, Riska remarked. All right. I'll also bring Botan. Most likely he's at dinner. See ya later, Yusuke said, bolting from the scene. Riska grinned, seeing Jiraiya encircling Tsunade. The two were so perfect for one Anothera why hadn't they realized that? Konoha. Danzo was disgusted. A surprise group from the Demio had come to visit and left the houses messy, they were told to do so by the Hokage. Danzo couldn't even send root nins out they were so busy cleaning, repairing, painting, patching, shopping, and other tedious things. 
he should be on the Hokage chair but no. Torun was dead and Carby was married to Tetra and off on a honeymoon. Danzo almost had steam coming out of his ears. The civilians laughed at him and the shinobi ignored him. He had become the laughingstock of the village. But soon, his one nin would make it to sound and an alliance would be forged. He had to wait. Off a distance a nin was running through the trees, her mission to get to sound. Suddenly, a kanai embedded itself in her skull, killing her instantly. Two nin dropped down from the trees. They were part of the root group that had been in the west. As they had completed the mission, their bodies began to turn to acid and melt all away. Soon, only three burn marks were all that was left of the nins. A small creature flew away towards the west. A sound nin had been alerted to the noise and went to investigate. Seeing nothing, he quickly reported to Kabuto. Not a thing. A mere bird, the ninja uttered, and Kabuto grinned. All right. I have an adequate amount of herbs. Let's head home, Kabuto said. The two left the sound village, not realizing that a second small bird was observing them closely. This bird, however, remained in its spot. Kabuto didn't even notice the bird as Karen approached. She was an easily controlled clone of some Uzumaki DNA. All he had to do was make her believe that she was having sex with Sasuke and that he had to leave for missions every day. Karen kept talking about having a baby for Sasuke, which made Kabuto sneer. The clone was real, but it didn't look like Sasuke. Have you located the necessary herbs? Karen inquired. Indeed. Now go. I have something to report to. Karen whispered, Gurren is in there having sex. Kabuto sighed, telling Orkamaru that he didn't think he could create a body like that but that everyone must have those needs. He went to his room to sleep, and as he closed his eyes, he drifted off to sleep. A calm, quiet voice spoke to him. Kabuto, you have until the new moon rises on the 9th to gather these herbs. The voice said, burn them brightly and I shall reward you with the power you seek. Kabuto replied, yes, mistress. Riska grinned in the west, watching the camp as she was finally realizing her dream of a united west and hopefully a more peaceful future. These herbs, when burned, would essentially still Orkamaru's progress back a couple of years. Orkamaru was trying to breed a body, but Riska had Kabuto place protection shields on Orkamaru to prevent such a thing. Riska's eyes shifted to her sword. She gave Jack and Demi a call. Demi asked, you wanted to see us? Riska gave a nod. What safeguards have you two put in place for the camp here? Replied Riska. Demi said to Riska, the usual. Shields and such. Why do you ask? Jack also appeared inquisitive. Riska raised her sword, pulsing purple lights. Jack's eyes grew icy. So, those Cretans are coming. My lady, let me have at them. Jack replied. Riska gave him a look. A loud alarm went off, and Riska said, my concern is the nins. If those things attack, we can hold our own but I don't know about the nins. If they are. Demi exclaimed, damn. As she and Riska and Jack ran out. Numerous animals were assaulting the camp. It was a kindness to call them human. Riska started yelling. Riska pulled her sword and yelled, don't let them get into the camp. Jack, Demi, cut loose. Kill these bastards. A stunning sword with exquisite calligraphy crafted from all. Black material. She maneuvered through two of the assailants. When she attempted to look at the ninjas, all she saw was a swarm of insects. A Cretan was in charge of a swarm of insects. All of a sudden, there were less bugs. Shino stood in the center of the swarm, unaffected by the attacks. The creature said, Who are you, boy? Shino gave a cool response. I am Shino, a bug user nin. The creature called out, Bug user, huh? Then you'll be the first to suffer. Swarm devoured this boy. Shino watched as the cluster grew closer and tighter. He had been using his bugs and others to work on a just you of his own. The creature laughed as the swarm approached. The creature exclaimed with delight, my swarm is made of man-eaters. They thrive off flesh. And the younger the better. Shino studied the horde. He thought now. Shino said, infecting wave bug swarm. Drives of bugs emerged from Shino's body. The swarm that was attacking him was getting closer. The creature exclaimed, it's over. 
I win. No, you lose, declared Shino. The creature saw his bugs with Shino's all of a sudden. What? Your bugs are now part of my colony. Or so they think. Asking as my bugs are in the swarm they will think so. Drain him. Said Shino. The massive structure encased the being and started to deplete him. The creature cried out, N O N O N O. I'm their master. Stu P P P P P. As the bugs began to drain his blood and chakra. Pretty soon there was just a husky. Shino got his bugs back. The other swarm hung in midair, buzzing. Shino created a seal, and the insects entered it. He was shocked as he turned to face the other combatants. The animals were falling behind. As quickly as they could, Naruto, Sasuke, Itachi, and Kakashi were taking them out. Meanwhile, Hanada, Hanabi, and Neji were finding the people who were hiding, and Tenten and Lee were taking them out. But it was a sight that chilled him to the bone that forced him to stop. In front of Kiba, a creature held a child captive. He is f hash dollar ked up. Was all that Shino could think. It stank, was enormous, and noisy. After a particular incident, Kiba was grateful that part of his training included ignoring strong smells. With cold eyes, he glared at the creature. The creature said, he he he, this is a little brat. Come closer and I'll eat her alive. The young girl was in tears. The creature said coldly, got this little chit from the village we are. She's nothing more than a gnat in my way. Akumaru and Kiba snarled. Kiba snarled, let her go. With a sick smile, the creature squeezed the little girl's body until she screamed in pain. Kiba roared, his eyes going red in the extreme. Kiba roared and charged the creature, saying, I will end you, Creatin. You don't harm pups. The creature was surprised. He threw the kid out to go greet Kiba. Kiba had a wild expression on his face, long hair, and red eyes. At that moment, the creature realized his error. He said, wait, referring to the pup. Is he? No, did the leader kill that one? Did he have kids? No, they would. Have facial marks, and his is red? Whoa, I should think again about this. Inform the leader that. Konoha. Danzo was in the infrastructure office, working at his desk. Right now the Hokage was having a meeting. He was desperate to get inside and, assist, in making decisions. There was an Anbu in his office. Danzo stood up, grinning, realizing that his, talk, with Asuna had paid off. He followed the Anbu to the Hokage's office, where he greeted the Hokage. The Hokage wishes to see you, the Anbu said. You wanted to see me, Lord Hokage? Danzo said, his expression composed. Yes, Danzo. I've noticed that some of the buildings still need to be rebuilt, and the merchants aren't willing to reimburse me for the money they borrowed using fake currency. Rebuilding the buildings is what you should be doing as head of the infrastructure office. In exchange for Demio paying off the debts, the merchants have promised to provide the necessary materials. But some of the money was in the hands of the Shimura clan. Since you are the head of the clan, even though you are a small clan with no real members, you will also have to reimburse Demio. You will be deducted half of your pay starting today and continuing until the balance is paid in full. You can receive credit for basic needs like food, but not for anything else. Additionally, unless I or the Demio give the order, you are free to leave the village. Danzo, are you understanding? Danzo stared in shock at the Hokage's icy words, damn Asuna. Indeed, Hokage. In an attempt to buy some time, Danzo stated, I will start work on rebuilding the building right away, but we are also fixing the water system. Of course, but the buildings also have significance. A present for you, huh? The Hokage opened a box and handed Danzo a ring, saying, the others have ring of office so I thought it best if you and one as well. Danzo put the ring on without thinking twice because he could still use the underground tunnels to escape the village. The Anbu descended after a minute. The Hokage said, you may leave. Danzo bowed and left, and Setsui grinned. The ring was meant to stop him from leaving. Once on, it would merely teleport him back. The passageways? Setsui inquired. Are now deemed forbidden and have seals applied to them. It's a good thing the root nin we captured wasn't very strong, the Anbu stated. Indeed. Another helpful tool is Asuna Haruno. A wise man waits with patience. 
A fool rushes in. In time, Koi, I will make him pay for his crimes but until then, I will cause him great suffering. Setsui said, throw a dog a bone and they're your best friend. Asuna, an extreme ass kisser, told Setsui about the meeting with Danzo and Danzo's love for the village. Western mountainous area. A thin man stood at the gate as Yusuke approached the mansion. The man said, stop, state your business. The man's eyes went white for a second before he said, I'm Yusuke, here to see Sakio and Toguro on business. Once the gate was opened, the man said, you may enter. Yusuke proceeded up the walkway to the doors that opened for him, and once inside, he went to the door at the end of the hallway and knocked. A voice called out, come in Yusuke. Yusuke entered the room. Sakio was given a second chance at life by Riska because he was a truly good person. He had been possessed by an evil spirit and had given in. Now he and Toguro were atoning for the sins. Yusuke spoke. A handsome man with a scar on his face sat facing the window. This letter was sent to you by Riska. She instructed me to deliver it in person. You would know how to handle the situation, she said. I am not sure why she did not send Jack, but she did not, Yusuke remarked. Sakio read the letter, growing more and more enraged as he went. He looked up, his eyes cold. Toguro, we need to finish this mission. She wants this man to understand the suffering he has caused others, which is why she chose not to send Jack. Sakio lit a cigarette and said, tell lady that we will make sure that this scum pays. Toguro then spoke. She did not want every villager to be dead and leveled. Days passed with the city in flames the last time Jack handled a case similar to this one. Toguro stated, in my opinion, that's excessive. Yusuke nodded. Yes, she was very angry for a while. Though I can't blame Jack, Yusuke remarked, and Sakio grinned. Yusuke, one thing about these kinds of people is that they always manage to get away. It goes without saying that someone with a spotless record would be thought to be a spy. And I would be greeted as a hero as the king of the black underworld, Sakio remarked. And following the hero's salute? Sakio stood up and went to the window, Yusuke said. Then the dominoes will start to fall. Setsui grinned, watching Danzo go about his job of supervising the rebuilding of the merchant's bank. Danzo felt entitled to the Hokage seat, and Setsui was turning him into a maggot. Danzo had promised Asuna that her merchant group would receive all the contracts from the daimyo in exchange for information. And Anbu came out of the shadows. Hokage, we've heard that Danzo dispatched a nin to look for outside assistance. The nin was eliminated. What are your goals? The Anbu inquired. Remove the pay docket for Danzo. One small step at a time. Steadily and slowly. Furthermore, not all of the infrastructure work has been finished. Setsui said, call Danzo to my office. The Anbu vanished and then reappeared in front of Danzo. Danzo winced at being told to go to the Hokage's office. Danzo came in with a phony expression on his face. Hokage, you want to see me? Though Danzo's mind was racing with rage, he said, I will have your seat in a level voice. Danzo, why haven't construction on the stadium, plaza, and merchant quarters begun? You have sufficient laborers, Setsui remarked. Hokage, we still haven't received the supplies for those. Setsui gave Danzo a sidelong glance as he said, the merchants say it will be at least a week before the land of iron ships the needed materials. Well, you ought to at least visit there in the interim. I'll get word out to you as soon as I can. Danzo's eye widened as Setsui said, also, I have been playing around with an offer the Demio sent and I think you'll love it. Setsui then smiled. Is he going to step down and make me Hokage? Danzo wondered. Danzo, tell me about your feelings toward marriage. Setsui inquired. Danzo said, I'm not married. Well, that's good. An elderly woman living in Demio is looking for a husband. Since she is roughly your age, is it possible that you could become her spouse? I could also pick someone else. Danzo's mind was racing, Setsui, pity that all her connections and influence will go to someone else. With that kind of connection, I could ascend to Demio. I must accept. Setsui grinned and said, if it is for the glory of Konoha, I will accept this marriage. Danzo agreed. Fantastic. I will communicate today. At last, everything is coming together, Setsui remarked. Danzo grinned and nodded before walking away. 
Setsui watched the creep disappear. Sir, nothing of that sort has been sent by the daimyo. For that, how are you going to find a wife? The Anbu said. Setsui grinned. He explained to the Anbu that Donzo's enlisted doctors had been working on a covert project. They wanted to control the third Hokage with a wife, so they made up a fake entity that Setsui learned about and trained her to obey him and him alone. She would be the ideal spy and act as a wonderful wife to Danzo. She is flawless. When will she be here? After a week. We'll then enjoy ourselves even more. Danzo is going to pay for his actions. He brought so much devastation and death. This is just the start. West. Kiba had a feral appearance, with long claws, fangs, and wild hair. The creature was shocked, thinking, this boy is his son. The leader needs to know that the dog king's son has arrived. I need to tell him. The creature started to run away, but Kiba's voice stopped it. Coward, I won't let you get away with it. I'm going to kill you. Kiba roared, and the creature saw only a blur before he was in front of him. Using his claws, he stabbed the creature in the stomach, causing it to scream as the flesh tore. How much do you enjoy pain? How f dollar underscore king daring you to damage puppets? The creature screamed in agony as Kiba continued to rip at its flesh, but the fight around them had stopped because the other creatures had been vanquished. Kiba. Kuranai said, gesturing to Kiba, who was holding a piece of flesh in his hand and had red eyes. Kiba stared at her, tears welling up in his eyes, noticing that the creature was barely conscious. Kiba started to calm down, examining the creature's shredded stomach area before dropping the chunk from his hand and approaching the child. Tsunade shook her head as she spoke. She will become immobile. Tsunade remarked, he must have broken her back. Kiba started crying. She is only a puppy. Lady Tsunade, why are these things so cruel? Why do they hurt innocent people every time? Kiba spoke, his expression icy as Demi spoke. Since they are purely malevolent. They are afraid of purity. Tsunade glanced at Kiba, a child is pure-hearted and their leader fears it, Demi remarked. Are you in pain? Kiba shook his head and asked Tsunade. Oh no, I slipped up. It's the blood of the beast. Kiba said, I'm going to wash it off, and as he turned to leave, the creature burst out laughing. Suddenly, Jack grabbed hold of him. Do you want this one, Demi? Jack spoke, and Demi's eyes lit up. Yes, I will hold this Cretan accountable for his crimes against the defenseless. Tell Riska I'll be back soon, Demi said, pulling the creature away. Jack shook his head, watching as the creature vanished, knowing that Riska would know why Demi had gone into the woods to kill it. Jack glared at the dead, who were being piled up in a big hope that Tsunade had made. Kiba stood there silently. Kuranai had her hand on his shoulder. Riska lightly touched Jack, signaling him to follow her. Has Demi not gone to question the creature? Riska inquired. Indeed. That boy behaved exactly like the dog king, Riska. Maybe he had an effect on him? Riska shook her head, Jack said. No, Jack. I believe Kiba may be the son of the Dog King. As per Gosh, he was married in the East. Given Kiba's recent actions, it's not impossible. That thing has imprisoned Gosh for the past nine years. I don't envy the man who had to face that man's wrath. He had only heard about some of the things that he had done. If he senses his child, he just might be able to get free and if he does the so. Called leader will have a reckoning coming, Riska said. Jack looked at her. Gosh has been imprisoned for years because the leader told him his family was dead. If Kiba is his son, then his wife is still alive. Jack? Jack cast a glance at Riska as she spoke. I apologize. I fell asleep. And those things are what about them? Riska nodded as Jack remarked, if we start now, we might have the nins trained to fight them. Indeed, Eric and Kahani ought to return tomorrow. We are going to start preparing them to battle the paranormal. Tell the demon slayers to come here as well. We must be prepared in case Muzan, that son of a bitch, attacks. Jack nodded as Riska stated, thank goodness we were close by when the attack occurred or else we might have all died. Indeed. When we swapped Rengoku's body, he was hardly conscious. Muzan could have eliminated them all had it not been for the mass attack. Jack said quietly, and Riska nodded. 
Yeah, they were able to defeat those two demons, but Muzin used that to try to kill them. As Jack walked away, he said, I'll send a message via Crow. Riska watched him go, thinking about the attack that had grabbed her attention. District for Entertainment Muzin grinned, his upper moons waiting, it worked, the attacks he planned, the Hashira were all here, that brat kid, he'll have him killed and his sister would become one of the upper moons, he'll destroy the demon slayers. All of the upper moons are present, then? Shinobu grinned as Tenten spoke. Indeed. It seems that they have transported the fighting to us. Shinobu grinned, the others are dispersed to see if they detect anything. Kanao grinned as well, glad to see Tanjiro again. Suddenly, a fire broke out, and Tenden leapt towards the sound while Shinobu searched for more people. Cannon for Demon Slayer fights. Tenten's wives were standing next to him when he heard laughter. He had been healed of the poison but had lost his arm. Okay, okay, okay. It appears that I've discovered a Hashira who is incapable of fighting. With the demon's words, he will be pleased, Makio leapt to shield Tengen. Hina, Suma, Makio, flee. Track down the others. The demon laughed as he sent his tongue to stab the girls, but the girls wouldn't move. Tengen said, worry and fear on his face. Certainly. My lord will richly reward me. Perish. Tengen tried to use his sword to at least deflect the attack, but he was barely able to move his arm, the demon said. Suddenly, a voice that they all believed to be dead spoke. Tengen stared in shock at the person in front of him as the sky lit up with fire and the voice said, flame breathing first form, unknowing fire. Hengoku? Tengen uttered. Tengen grinned as Rengoku said, hello, sorry I'm late. So, you exist and I'm still alive, correct? Tengen made a joke. Yes, I apologize for the inconvenience caused by the train in Muggen, but Muzin wants to kill us all. Some allies of ours who despise him just as much as we do save me. Rengoku grinned, and they came with me to ensure the destruction of the demons. Tengen grinned, too, but then they heard a loud boom that startled them. A demon was flung toward them, encircled by flames that were both purple and black. A woman with nearly burning hair, dressed in a dark purple cloak, trailed behind the demon. You dirty scum! Attacking those who are injured. The demon was writhing in agony when the woman's voice said, I'll send that Muzin a message he'll never forget. Please. Allow the sun to scorch me. The demon cried out, please kill me. Tengen's eyes grew wide at the sight of the sword's hilt. Everyone was aware of the weapon and its wielder. Tengen whispered to his wives, Muzin is F$ underscore Ked. They nodded. Send this message to Muzin. When you deliver this message to him, the fire will cease. Now, get out of my sight. The Soul Queen is coming for him, and there will be hell to pay. The demon fled as the woman yelled, turning to face the others. My friends are helping the others. Both Muzin and civilians appear to be planning to target the Ashira. Muzin will say that this devastation was brought about by the Hashira. I'm Riska, and I'd like to invite all the Hashira to come to the west with me. Oh, dear, Riska said. What about the innocent people, the swordsmith village, and the butterfly mansion? Tengen uttered. You would still be able to fight Muzin and the demons but with the protection of the west. Muzin will stop at nothing to destroy the Kamado line and the Hashira. Riska stated. However, master? As Tengen finished speaking, a crow appeared out of nowhere. The master has moved to the west. Tengen gave them a brief account of what happened, and the other Hashira arrived, shocked to see Rengoku. He says follow, the crow said. Let's go. Riska was relieved that they had arrived. Tanjiro had informed Lady Tamayo that they were welcome to enlist. She had joined the west. They had intensified their training now that they were out of Muzan's easy grasp. In a short while, they would be able to confront the upper moons once more, and hopefully the outcome would be different. So that's it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to the channel for more awesome stories like this. Thank you. See you all in my next video.